Yezo! Ha! You guys weren't expecting just to hear my voice. This, I think this is the first time that I've been the first one to intro with the Yizo. Antonizi, our beloved porcelain princess, is taking the week off. So shout out to love her it. radical rest. I am joined by a queen. I love it. I, I picked and chose no one other to fill the shoes of Antoinette. I just want to say I miss Antoinette. Like I know. I'm going to have to come back and say hi because I miss her so much. And I just She, she has her. some big shoes to fill and I'm no, lightweight nervous to be doing this by myself. But <laughs> Here we we here together. How about that? How about it? For those of mind. you who just don't know who that voice is, I am here with Erin. Erin Amel. You might be uh, familiar with her Instagram and her amazing brand. And Oh, you don't like to be called a brand, so let me bring that back. Her, her amazing business. So, Erin what is your Instagram? Because I didn't even bring it up to know it off the top of my head. Hold up. Let me, let me bring no it that. Instagram is at Erin Amelism. The Aaron study Amelism. of Erin Amel. It's so funny when I created that. I feel like Instagram has been ancient and like renewed so many different times that like, just thinking about when you first started Instagram. And like where we're at now and like where whatever your at name is now is kind of like, this is who you are. This is still right. Who you are, so. right. The well, study of Erin Bell. I'm so happy to have you here. We have an amazing episode to go through together. I'm um, excited. This is the second time that you joined us. Yes. We the second. Were... The... I had go locks ahead. the first time too. Did you have, were you just starting your locks? I think I was first showing the world my locks at that point mm -hmm. i was about We're maybe like go a year into your updates because you definitely went and cut off all of your locks um and Girl, women i started by combing hair. them out i started oh. by combing them out so that's a whole it's a whole process it was it was layered well I know, you know something's going on when a woman cuts her hair so we're gonna learn about it um we'll just start off with some updates i'll i'll just share my shit it's actually it felt like i haven't been in this seat just doing the regular podcast in weeks we've been traveling to New York and like doing again a lot of guests but um I just Around the way I curling. feel like with all of this movement I feel like I'm like on the on the edge of something on the precipice of something I feel like the energy is just pushing me forward in all yeah. the areas of my life and like changes At coming Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm trying to brace yourself. It. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to brace myself. I'm trying to ground myself. Most importantly, um, I'm trying to figure out exactly what I want so that I'm like not dragged a completely different direction than, than where I want yep. to be. So I'm like, yeah, just like feeling the thing and trying to ground myself and like ground myself in gratitude, but also like this energy of, of what I want yeah, um, like charging forward. Yeah, yeah. Pre with precision, you with know. It's like with, like you said, with the Pulling gratitude. That arrow back. I'm a motherfucking right. sag, so like I, yes. I, you know, that bow and arrow, like. Yep. <laughs> the are like you got your eye on something, you know. It's actually like refine. Like I feel like I'm also in this space of like refining mm -hmm. what it is that I want because, like you said, like you feel like you're on the edge of a breakthrough. Everything is shifting and changing, you know. Um, and the possibilities truly are right now endless. You get what I'm saying? Like and they have no choice that, but to be. Yeah. And to sit in that though, too. Like, I think that yeah. we say that, but to actually feel like, Oh shit. Like I can do anything I want to do. I have to figure out what it is I want to do. What do I want to do? Like, yeah. That can feel daunting, but here we are. It's like sitting with gratitude with it though, yes. because part of it, the other half of it is enjoying the journey. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So it's like it, there's this balance of putting forth the energy, being present with it, and also being grateful for the entire ride. It's a it's cocktail. A it's a practice now because sometimes you get scared as, as all hell. Sometimes you yes. pulled in all different directions, but I'm doing it. I'm I'm taking it slow. Um, it looks good on you. Thank you. Yeah, it I've looks been, good um, on you. 
I've also discovered the miracle of instant oatmeal. I know that sounds crazy. A lot of people say instant oatmeal is really bad for you, but I've Look discovered sprouted, oatmeal. sprouted instant oatmeal from Whole Foods. Oh, wow. And it's changed the game for me because breakfast, it's too much it's work. Difficult. I'm busy. It's difficult. Breakfast like I'm not hard. that hungry. So I just make this little instant oatmeal and it's not even a package. Like I weigh it out so I don't feel as guilty. Like, you know, nice. it's I like a weigh scoop. it out, scoop, scoop. It's about eight bites. And then my belly is nice. full and I'm on my, I'm, I'm around. Like, and it's to start oatmeal. My and it's oatmeal. So, so I feel good you feel myself. good. It's a game changer. I can't Are remember the brand of it, but uh, when I get that together, I will share it with you guys because it's really your grown really, ass woman. I'm a grown ass woman. I got some Whole Foods sprouted instant <laughs> oats. You heard me? Well, yeah, right. Your grown uh, ass woman. Fire what else have I been doing? I've been watching Sex in the City. Video. I've been watching. I've been Sex trying to get into it. I've been watching. I, I'm not talking about the new one. I'm talking about the old. I me too. I've one. been trying. I've been trying to get into old Sex in the City. I felt like I was too young to get into yes. the tea. I was like speaking yes. into the TV. So I'm trying to like put myself in the mood because I feel like, tell me if you can relate. I don't know. Just having accessibility online. You, you are cultivating. You're in the middle of your own Sex in the City. Word. And you feel it. You get what I'm saying? You feel it. And it's like, what position? You almost have, we have a manuscript of like <laughs> how to navigate that you get what i'm saying <laughs> like that's the part of the reason why i want to like break down and get back into it i've i'm on season five now and i think what <laughs> i am appreciating about it at, at this age that you're saying how universal the themes were like even for these right. you know rich white ladies in new york city a lot of the themes that are coming up around relationships and being single and like life yeah. choices that you make i'm like wow this is really it's really well done. So I'm, it's, I'm going over that timeless. again. It was timeless. Yes. It, it's, it's giving timeless. timeless. Mm -hmm. I will say, I'm at season five, and I will say that Carrie Bradshaw's hair is a <laughs> fucking mess. She progressively <laughs> looks a mess because they hate curls. You, you can see, like, yeah. the anti-blackness in, in the show. It was she giving... started off with this healthy, wild curls, and then all of a sudden, brittle, brittle girl, drop. <laughs> they tried brittle. to make it into these waves. I was like, if you y'all are, and then they cut. She has this weird bob right now that she, and then they wand curl wand the curls. I'm like, wow, you would do anything but have this bitch rock her natural. White women are also hating That's... their curls. I said, yep. wow. Wow. Wouldn't it be interesting if like she chose to wear her hair like this? Like she had all autonomy to choose to wear which way to wear her hair. I just don't want to hear that side and that this is what you chose. Exactly. Cause season five is a mess. I said, wow, it's Carrie is not, she's actually not that cute. Cause I, I'm, a, I think she's a really sexy woman. Like everyone Same. says she looked like a foot or a horse or whatever, but I, I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think she epitomizes I, to me women. I think Androg is like, I don't know, epitomizes women to mm -hmm. me. Like, it's like this balance of both energies that can nurture and like, right. You know, like bring forth life. Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, it's the right. ultimate power. So, like, I don't know. That's rude. A foot. It, <laughs> it is rude. It wasn't nice, Aaron. It was that's rude funny. that they said she looked like a shoe and I don't... a horse. But I'm I'm telling you, season five is giving a little bit of that when they let the, when they did when they did that to her hair, and I'm I need to see these memes. I need to see the comparison. It's just the when you when you get into it and you get into the seasons, and again, you know, yeah, you're all attached to this character. You're attached to her fashion, and then you see what they do to her hair, and I'm like, wow, it's just because even white women anti hate yeah hate their girls, even white women because. On, especially on themselves, they'll walk up to you and be like, oh, this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I like what you do with the place. You get what I'm saying? And like, but like, Shout out to all the Jewish girls with the amazing curls. You better love your motherfucking curls. You better do your big chops. Juice chop them up. Yeah, big chops. straightening nope. it. 
no no brittle fucking conditioner on that hair. No brittle bobs. No, <laughs> no brittle, brittle bobs. <laughs> that brittle bob is season, <laughs> it's season five. I said, "Wow, I don't think I can finish this now. This bitch got to do somebody." Like I don't give a fuck about her story. She's just no more. like right. Like she got to go. Like she clearly, to... she's in distress. That's what it's giving. She's in distress. <laughs> She's in limbo. I'm not even going to hold her because this is what I'm giving. Like, I'm giving love. No, she was in not at all. For two years. That leads us to your update. For those of you who are not on Patreon, that sucks for you. But for those of you who are on Patreon, you can see that Aaron has this beautiful short cut, slick to the side, colored, given, oh, given 90s, fine. Given a round away exactly girl, what I'm fine. But she used to have a head of locks that, you know, I remember you being very proudly cultivating them. What happened? Girl, I, okay, so when I locked my hair, I did it extremely impulsively. You know, I had been trying to do it forever. For for commentary, like I'm an Aquarius rising, so I'm extremely mixy, right? I see. I'm extremely mixy. (laughs) As much as I try to be like, I know what I like. I like the same things. Like, no, like I like to switch it up. I like to change it up. And um, when I locked my hair impulsively, I was committed to the fact of like everybody telling me over the, like the course of my life, like I would never be able to lock my hair. That was like one of the things that I could always do. They would say, you know, you could wear every hairstyle, but I never see you locking your hair. Like you can't sit still for that. And I was like, yes, I can. I just don't want to. Um, And what's funny, (laughs) funny you mentioned that because what's crazy is I felt like, um, I don't know, like a true testament to myself, as much as I was like proclaiming that I could do it, I hadn't done it because I couldn't. I realized it was just something that I felt like I needed to really journey through and sit with myself. Like you can't talk about, I couldn't even talk about what my hair texture was without completely leaving it alone. And I still think with free hair, we're managing it, manipulating it, Mm -hmm. cutting it, styling it. I wanted an opportunity just to know what I look like, like when I woke up in the morning, wild, if I was like, you know, on an island somewhere, you get what I said, I wanted that wild woman experience. And I, I felt very sensual. I fell in love with my sensuality during that experience. So here I am growing shedding you get what i'm saying mm-hmm. but not like in the literal sense of my hair but kind of like just a whole bunch of like customs and things and norms and i'm growing up right mm-hmm. so i'm looking at myself and i'm looking at my hair and i'm looking at all all the things that i've learned all the weight that i've carried all the women that i've been in this like one style and process right mm. and one day i was having this like i don't know like a, it was just this overwhelming motion that was just like this journey is done like you said i've been pushed and everything felt like what's next what's next what's next and i felt like i was really holding myself to like the pseudo commitment that i made just to prove to whoever else in the you know in the back of their mind said that i couldn't do it and i had a moment with myself and i was like aaron you did it your hair has been locked for four years you did it like point blank period if you decided this morning to go in there and chop them off like it's been done you have them and it there's nothing that can change that experience for you nothing that would take away these past four years like you doing it like twisting from twisting my hair like i said impulsively leaving them i pretty much went like uh i call it organized free form So like Mm -hmm. my locks were not all one size you get what Mm -hmm. i'm saying like you know i kind of like i just did whatever i felt I I went intuitive with it. Mm -hmm. So when I went into it intuitively, I told myself like I would go out the same way. So I pretty much was like, you know, feeling very like claustrophobic within myself, Mm. you know, as like uh, identifying as a very free woman. And I don't mean free in a sense. I think like that's a, the, the narrative now, free, modern, all this stuff like has such a negative connotation. I feel like there's a lot of media being pumped up like, um, what that woman represents. And for me, free is just having full autonomy to my choices and decisions, you know? Like, I want to grow my hair because I want to grow my hair. I want to be bald-headed because I want to be bald-headed, you know? Like, not really being tied to um, any other opinion aside from my own. And the way to do so is to be in touch with yourself. So, it's very interesting how I had kind of like all the narrative that I had been pushing and fighting. I realized like I was actually like digesting. I was consuming. Mm-hmm. So I challenged myself. I said, okay, I'm going to take a week off. 
I'm going to do nothing and I'm going to sit with myself and my thoughts and I'm going to comb my hair. I'm going to like comb them out. So I used a whole bunch of conditioner, girl. I'm going through it. It, it was a lot more emotional than I anticipated it to be. Hmm. I combed my hair down and I literally have pictures. I'm going to send you some after we get off the, um, the chat. But like my hair like came all the way past my nipple. Wow. Like, girl. I started my locks, girl. I started my locks. Like my hair was like less than half an inch on my head, right? So here's this process where this unfreeing was supposed to be very like cathartic and, you know, like a new experience for me, I felt like it was doing quite the opposite. It was overwhelming me. I had never had that much hair on my head. I go mm. from being like bald to like overwhelmed by all this hair. And I'm just like, this is not what that was supposed to do. It gave me a new worry. So I literally just sat in the mirror and was just like, <sighs> I love that. I love that for you. I love all of that. I love it especially does. you saying I'm done with the locks because I think so many people think when they, they, grow their locks out it's like it's like oh i have to stick with this or like yeah. i have to get them really long like you know what i mean yeah. like that and same I, kind of conditioning with hair and having long hair happen and i felt that me subscribing to that it's like i had no desire i didn't even know what i would look like right and then like as people are seeing me they're like oh you look I can't wait to see, you know, their mm -hmm. projections started to fail on me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of like, I'm not tied to it either way. I'm going to be disappointing. I, but once I realized, oh, my followers are going to drop. Once people know, like, I've uncombed my hair. Because some people are only following me because that was the, that's what they romanticized. That's, wow. That was the draw. And to me, I'm like, this is such a, the smallest part of my journey. If you, if you started following me at this part of me being locked, you're late here. You get what I'm saying? Like, or you have no new. idea what I'm actually about. You have, I've cleaned it up, honey. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? <laughs> I've cleaned it up, baby. So like what you're getting from me is you're getting this new woman and she has, she was in a cocoon. You get what I'm saying? And that's why I locked my hair. I locked my hair to settle down, to protect myself, to, to get on board, to get on focus. Mm. And now it's just like, you know, I'm ready to, be, I'm like in a bottle, like in a soda bottle, all shaken up. Like I was ready to be released and I'm back. Well, it looks, you, you look good no matter what you do. So shout out Thank to this short hair, fine ass woman that you are like right Tweety now. Bird. It's cute. Oh, you get I like it. it. <laughs> I like Tweety Bird. I love so it. Cute. My mama used to good. call me Tweety Bird when I was a little girl. And I was like, it's giving inner child work. Perfect it's giving for the inner child show. work. Perfect for what we're about to talk about. Shout out to yep. that. What an update. Um, I'm going to move on to some hot shit. Now, this just came to me. Um, yesterday while scrolling, I was actually looking at Kanye West's posts and then somebody it, within the comments was like, this bull, this bull spitting. And right when I hear anybody say bull, I'm like, oh, you must, you have to be from Philly. So I right. went and I clicked on their um, profile and this is the most beautiful artwork and artist that I have ever seen in a really nice. long time. Now I'm not like, um, I'm not really like, I, I appreciate pottery, but this right. is like black ass pottery. So think okay. of like Greek vessels that are really curvaceous that, you know, have oh, like the, and yeah, that have like the costumes. imagery on it that like tell oh, a story. Beautiful. So nice. he has these gorgeous vessels, but on the the pot are black ass images. And so there's images of like what's going on in, in his hood, you know, on this like Greek classic ancient looking pot. He makes these gorgeous teapots that have um, oh, bell much. hooks on them and just amazing black feminist activists yeah. on it. His name is Roberto Lugo. He's in Philly. He's an artist, activist, educator, poet, and he's the founder of the Village Potter. So I recommend that all of you guys go to his yes, um, Instagram. Do. It's Roberto. I'm going to spell it all out for you guys, but check it out because it's just like, it, it, it's the dopest shit. And it made me be like, oh, if this shit was like $25,000 and I could afford it, I would immediately buy his artwork because... It's it's just doing it's just hitting it's all of doing it. everything. Yeah. The, how do you how do you spell? I'm gonna his last spell name? it right now. It's R O B E R T O 
L-U-G-O-W-I-T-H O U T wax. So it's Roberto yeah, Bugo without wax. And uh again, I just I'm I'm just flabbergasted and I, I'm I'm Ooh, rooting I for that. him. Like he has a fan. And I think he like releases these collections every now and then um of just like simple cups and you know, like everyday things that people can buy that aren't a bajillion dollars and I'm definitely going to look out of it because <laughs> this his is... teapot, I love it. Do you see it? Yeah. Isn't it cute? It's yes, just, I it's, love it. It's yes. amazing. I love it. It is. The joy the truth. I love it. It's so cute. I'm here for it. I'm here for um, it. So, <laughs> this and, <fool>. and he's, <laughs> crazy. he's crazy. And he's like this passionate like, and he's passionate Latino boy that like you know, does poetry he like, and like, like a family guy. Yeah, and he's, he's silly. Cute. So when I meet him, he's got a fan because I'm I'm really hype off of him, and I want to check out the Village Potter as well. Village Potter two hundred five. I want this. I want this um, bell hook. Pop mug. culture. I have I, I have this question for you. I wonder. Uh, yeah, I'm really curious how you respond. So I, I was uh, scrolling and I saw that Keisha Cole shared a story, and I don't know much like a. Apparently, Keisha Cole has a lot of um, stories stories and antics that have been very public. I guess she had a show with her mom and like people are really mm-hmm. invested in Keisha Cole. I don't know that much about her, but I guess it's okay. giving me a glimpse into her. I know a little bit about old Keisha. I don't know anything well, about this story, but I do this know may, old Keisha. This may make sense to you, and I'm just curious as to what you think. So she recalled a time that she and Eve, our Philly beloved Eve, E-V-E, E-V-E were close skirt. friends. But Keisha was, I guess she was just out here wilding and apparently <laughs> Keisha and Eve were walking along and a fan or somebody touched Eve's purse mm-hmm. and Keisha turned around and smacked the girl in the face. And Eve was like, yo, I can't fuck with you anymore because you're, you're crazy. A liability. Like, like you can't just be like, And yeah. Keisha Cole was like, but girl, I got your back. Like, I don't, I don't. Your friend. Like, what's I'm wrong? Friend. Like, what you talking about? So my question is like, what, what would you do? Like, would you have done like even, but like, yo, I can't fuck with you anymore. You, you, you are well. Like, what do you do with your overzealous friends? Because we may not have friends that are like, um, go to the extent of violence but you have your friends that are like hype in different ways they're very protective or they're like you say one thing and they're like oh i hate this person too or like you know what i mean no 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 i completely i know so much of what you mean that um i'm gonna kind of throw myself under the bus here and kind of admit that i am that friend oh I'm a little like I'm working on myself and this is like the whole this whole episode I think is just really funny um, because it relates because what I can acknowledge specifically with Keisha is childhood trauma and Mm. how like a bad relationship with your mom really does just affect your relationship with other women and I've let's just say the past two years specifically I've been doing a lot more like conscious and intentional work around that you know just I so I can relate so, you know, that's my girl. I do anything for my girl. Yeah. And then, like, is. your girl also being, like, in a, another space where you, you're, you're t- with that tone, it's like, Eve understood that, you know? Mm-hmm. That's a girl. She's been in from the same situations. They've, she knows that. However, she has elevated and grown or in parts of her journey, she's in a different place. You can't teach that to your home girl. You get what I'm saying? Nothing but time and opportunity and her own personal choices are going to get her to that place. You know, you can support her, but at the same time, it's also like, you know, I've had, I've had what I, who I feared as home girls kind of like decide that, you know what, Erin, you don't look good for the brand. (laughs) (laughs) Especially if I'm like, I'm not a brand. I'm not, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I've had to kind of like really accept, like, I mean, well, but my well-meaning is not the same way. And that's honestly, that's good because you ain't going to ride for me the same and I'm not going to be able to read it the same way, you know? So it's like, Keisha, you can't go slapping stranger. You give us, I probably would have asked permission. You give it a say like, yo, you good? Like double check them. I would probably wouldn't have <laughs> knee jerk so quick, but I can't say, 
you grabbed her purse? That's weird. Like, don't she deserve to be smacked? Like, well, listen, listen. But Eve was like, listen, I got a place that I need to be. I got, I'm at a certain <laughs> place. I got to cut you out, yeah. you wildin'. And I think, I think it was, I didn't listen to the full episode, but just like you said, I think, and I don't know how she cut her off. Like, I don't know if I'm fuck with you. But I, I hope think she sent this, her a card and some flowers. Like, I love you, boo, but. But I, you know. I, I liability. Love her, right. I love the compassion and the grace that you're like, because that, that's real. Like, the only reason she's wilding like that is is from a place of, like, shit. She probably had to protect herself at all costs. And that's well, how she was taught to that's behave. That's how she was that she right. Loved, so, it but, was instant. It wasn't even like, I'm out here trying to look bad for you. No, the truth is. Like, th- it was situational. And, you know, the first, her knee-jerk reaction wasn't wasn't the most graceful. And, you know, the relationships with women are delicate in that way. I've wow. learned. Girl, well, I've learned. I, th- I think he should learn her lesson. From that, I think she learned her lesson. Oh, she did. But, uh... Clearly, we ain't here. Has that woman ever come out with the story <laughs> that I got slapped by Keisha Cole? I've never heard it. <laughs> did it happen? Maybe uh... Keisha could- Eve cut her off for another reason. We don't know, but well, like Eve probably many reasons. Eve was like, "I'm trying to marry a billionaire white man, and you making my brand look bad." Like the, exactly, the she's like here. literally like she went from Stevie J to like House on the Hills. Who and, is that man? Who is who? that? And he's like a generic white man too. You know, he's not like you know how some of the white men be like fine white striking. men. You like oh. striking. Yeah, you're no. like damn. I get it. I get it. No, Eve but he's is just he's just like. A fluffy white man, like a you like know, a, he a he feels genius. comfortable and safe. Like she 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 living she, by bless them. their she child. Happy. She having a yep. baby by them. Bless that child. Bless, bless Eve. that baby. She made it out the hood. Shout that out that Philly Eve. baby. I'm keeping that Philly baby. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of another Philly baby, Quinta Quinta Brunson. You know Quinta, right? Yes, so, a lord. A lord, you got money. <laughs> Shout out to her progression. Shout out to her Amen. longevity via the the interwebs. Yeah, but shout that, out to working women. That's my Sagittarius Citroen. That's my girl, and yes, she was just recently on the shop with LeBron James. Her peers, she's amongst her peers. Them being Donald Glover and LeBron James. Ooh. Yes, peers. And I was, I'm so happy for her because. Donald Glover was giving her her flowers and he was saying how impressed he was for her creation of Abbott Elementary. And he said he was, this is what he said. He says, watching, I was so jealous because I was like, this is a good show. And it's hard to do that on network television. That's hard to do, doing it on a big stage like that and not pulling punches and understanding yourself enough to get it through. That's really hard. So, I, I don't know about you, but I love Donald Glover. I, I love he, Donald Glover. Yeah. That's a who I he's an That is a very this is a brilliant man. Brilliant man. So for him yeah. to be kind of like, you know, bowing no, down and giving off her to flowers, you. Right. Shout out it, to on Clint, a public but, display a public yes. display. That's one thing that I do know or I've heard about him. Like, you know, as far as his spirit is, like he's very like honorary without the need to kind of like like no, I don't want you I'm not the celebrity here, like the masterminds are, you know, it's kinda like highlighting great thinkers, you know. And I really think that's dope. Shout out to Quinta, man. Like Shout out to Quinta. I would you're be just writing vine shaking skits. in my boots though. Like she vine was skits. child to an ABC sitcom is national it this i don't know I what it's so. it's on hulu so uh, when it's on hulu I don't it's on hulu it's on it, it's on hulu <laughs> what network it is i think it's right, abc i think it's i think it's abc too. check it out you better fact check yep. yeah we don't want to tell the people the wrong thing they listen right but white people don't fact check apparently because ABC? the black panther director ryan coogler was mistakenly detained by police because this nigga went into a bank And the white people thought that he was helping stage a robbery and call the cops on him. To stage it? from Yeah, he was staging a robbery. So this nigga probably going to the bank like, let me get $150,000 cash. Let me drop my bands. (laughs) Because I'm a rich man. Wakanda forever. (laughs) I'm rich forever. And these white people were like, no, it doesn't make sense. Definitely trying to rob us. Um, no, you're setting us up here. Your money's your, your money's up. in the back, but you're setting us up here. <laughs> and and broad daylight. That man to jail, child. I 
you know what? You know, I, I, what I don't like about things like that, it's like, the, what there is never an appropriate response. Like, no matter how angry, embarrassed, and frustrated we are, there's never an appropriate response other than submission. And I'm like, to think, what would I have done as a civilian in my bank? You get what I'm saying? Like, going to take out $20. What the fuck? You get what I'm saying? Like, who the fuck? He must have been asking for a lot of money. He must have asked him because apparently he walked in. He like wrote the amount on a piece of paper and like handed over discreetly. He was like, run me my paper. And I guess they were like his friends. It says uh, two of his colleagues were in the car. So the, they must have seen his friends. Okay, in there. So see. They were like, oh, okay, this nigga see. doing some, some dangerous criminal shit. Okay. And so the what? white woman got scared. She did what she was she what she thought she was supposed to do. But he did. What is the procedure when there's a gun in your face? You remember that? Is that it all? But there was no gun though. That's what I'm saying. That's what she was giving. She's giving what is the procedure when there's a gun in your face? Exactly. When there's a black man asking for lots it, of money. For his money. That he for his like, money. did she even did she even go look to see if he had it? Did she look at his motherfucking thing? That's Girl. what I'm saying. Like, did he swipe his debit card for it to come up yet? Yeah, did we get to that point? Did he, did put, he put his, his pen, pen in, bitch? Did he put his pen in? Like, <laughs> ask him his... Sir, it was declined. I think you hit the wrong button. Could you try it again? You get what I'm saying? Like, I... Now, I do... I do... This is just me being nosy. I want to see the surveillance cameras. I need to see... Did he just write it down? Did he flip it? Like... What I don't about know this what he had on too? Like, did he Girl, come it in was with like, a, like, no, no, I saw him in a gray hoodie. I saw him in a gray hoodie. Like, it, it was, was a gray hoodie. Yeah, it, light gray, heather gray. It's giving broad day. Like, he tried it. <laughs> running errands. <laughs> like, not a hoodie. Girl, <laughs> girl. He said, hundred fifty cash, and I'm gonna put because I'm about hoodie. to go anyway. Yo, he was he was walling. I hope he ain't asked for that much. I hope he asked for so much. I hope he did ask for $150,000 in one because I'm taking was... my boys out yep. to the shaky butts and <laughs> I don't want my wife to know. Butts. Let's go. Like, no, let's facts. hurry this I shit wanted the pennies so I could throw <laughs> it at the pigeons. He could say however he wanted to, yep. but he, uh, what he said to was, land you spent it, uh, like an evening or afternoon in jail and then you have to get out and tell the world. So I hope it Like, that's embarrassing. Yeah. Stop counting my and money. He's coming out with the next Wakanda forever. That that next Black Panther gonna be political and radical as shit. <laughs> it's gonna be in a bank. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna blow up a bank. He's gonna have some bank tellers getting fucked. That would be yeah. amazing if he did that. If he like had a scene in a bank for like, like, a, like just like a pass through, like a quick little like <laughs> quick little interaction. I hope he does that. I Me hope too. it's radical as shit. I hope it's just like you know. You better put it in the books like, forever. You know, don't have to rewrite your your history. You better put it in that movie. He uh, He should give you credit. What he said was, this situation should never have happened. However, Bank of America... Oh, that's the bank. Just so y'all know. Listen! Bank of America worked with me and addressed it to my satisfaction, and we have moved on. Bank of America, that just shows you. That that sounds about right. That's how America Yeah, but he... Yeah, but he... The irony. He made, you know, Wakanda forever and he banking with Bank of America. I don't know Isn't if I feel irony? bad. I don't know Isn't if it? I feel I don't know how I feel anymore. You better go to a black bank and let them Would they discriminate you? Money? They would have given you your money. Like, they might not have given you that one fifty on the draw, but <laughs> they might have had you come back the next day to come pick it up. <laughs> but like <laughs> next week. But like you would have been able to get your money. Like shout out to black businesses. In politics, now, there's a lot going on in politics, especially with Russia and Ukraine. Antoinette has probably so much to say. I, I, I do as well, of course, which probably differ from Antoinette's um, points and facts. I'm, you know, white people going to do what they do facts. and secure the bag however they possibly can. And that's always the, the rule expense. of the game. Yeah, but, uh, anyway. we'll, we'll go deeply into that um Next week I can't wait Antoinette. to hear Antoinette. Yeah, I can't wait. It's not goes ham. You know, she starts talking I know. about senators and 
Oh, know, she started pulling cards. She started members. She started As like. She should <laughs> pull their cards. Like, oh, here's his beeper number. Here's she his does. daughter's she Instagram. Can fall into yes. it. I'm like, girl. I love it. I love it. They all <laughs> doing the same thing, girl. But, no. uh. <laughs> Such a sad. I am. I'm just like, girl, girl. it's all the same thing now. Money, money, power, respect. You know, money, yeah. cash, hoes. No different than Jay Z. Money over everything. About. Right. <laughs> Um, but we'll definitely uh, get into that. But this week, I, I will talk about Blessed Biden. Biden has come through and given Biden. HBCUs over $2.7 billion over the last year via the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund. So this relief fund requires all of these funds to be used, excuse me, requires half of these funds to be used to, br- to provide direct financial relief to students. So if you went to an HBCU, please, please, please make sure that that is happening for you, that you are getting some relief because, you know, the schools then got some money and that is a requirement that they help with the financial relief to students. So please take advantage. Ask, you know, your um, counselors, advisors. Yeah. Ask folks like, yo, run, wh- how, how can I benefit? How do from I that? run to the money? Yeah. Like, how can I help with that? Uh, but shout out to that. That's important. That's important. If you go to Howard, you make sure you hold them accountable publicly. <laughs> you know, what well, we were just going through a couple of months ago. Yeah. Especially like, yeah, everybody who's been on, you know, Twitter advocating for the conditions of their, their campus and housing and living. No, this is your time. Like, you got that money. At the door. You and you can money. you can look specifically at how much money your um, school was given if you go nice. to the site, the American Rescue Plan. Um, it's on the government site, and it details and gives exactly how much each college received. That's so, cute. Um, accountability. Accountability. It's giving, it's giving Bitcoin for the <laughs> colleges. Like, it's giving, like, public ledger. Like, I like that. Um, I mean, I'm not against it. I, I'm 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 happy about it, and I hope it's put good to put to good use. And I hope all Same. again, like you students, are aware of that, and that you demand that it's being put to good use. Max. Um, Biden is also encouraging folks to get back in the office and um, go back to work. Like, stop working from home, go back to the office, especially now that the COVID cases have fallen. I'm such a Virgo, so I don't know if my contributions to the parts of this conversation are even what's what, what's a Virgo's. Uh, that's amazing. A Sag and a Virgo talk about politics. That's funny. <laughs> what you got to that's, say about that? That actually sounds like a political joke right there. That's it. <laughs> but um, for the most part, I'm like beyond the fact that, like you know, like we're still actively in a pandemic. Okay, like that is. That is a very important part of this, but let's just for a second imagine we've all just been on a two-year vacation, right? For the sake of emphasizing getting back into office. Um, We also see like where these gas prices and inflation and everything is right now. And I have this, I'm seeing it. I I see everything's so high right now because nobody's working. (laughs) We are like literally like they are trying to make up for the flow of the money through the places that we have to spend it. You get what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. because of that, I'm like part of the reason why they want to get us back into the office. is so we go we go back to happy hours. We go back to brunches. We go back to doing the going back to the grocery store for ourselves. We go back to using the gas. So the gas prices go down. Like as far as the way. Unfortunately, this structure is set up in cap in a very capitalistic way. It works better when we're all working. <laughs> when the you know, or is eat- happening. Yeah. Yeah. When the f- traffic is flowing, when like, you know, like when we are active, when we are active in our lifestyle. Now, do I believe that there's a way to be active and like to be forward, like progressive, active and like different than before? Absolutely. I think we're actually in a very fertile place where we can redirect or reset up or reconfigure what that working world looks like, where it doesn't look the same as it did before, but it also like advocates for the mental health. It advocates for everything that we've learned within the last two years. You get what I'm saying? So I don't think it's as simple as, or it could be as simple as go back to work. Yeah, we get back to work, but what are what is being in place or what's going to be implemented to ensure that we don't 
become a society that runs ourselves back into the ground. You get what I'm saying? That, that, that this thing perpetuates and it happens again. So we are too fragile to not think of one another in a way of like looking at like me working does help someone else. You know, um, I think as a society right now, a lot of us individually, our families are hurting financially. Um, that would not necessarily be the case if we were collecting. If we're carpooling again, going to work. If we're utilizing our community and our services but again for what they were established for, they weren't. We weren't. We're not. Peop, we're not made to live on our own. You know, we're not made mm-hmm. to be isolated. We're not mm-hmm. made to have to build everything ourselves. So without the community, without the outreach, and without even our children experiencing what that world looks like networking socially like in person i i think it's like imperative we do so we just have to figure out how to do so safely and in a way that like you know represents the care and compassion for us all you know immunocompromised and to expect biden or the government to like enforce that i think it's yeah. impossible but i love I the idea ex- of how how to yeah. do that or how to extend yourself like what like, works do like, it together i love that idea that's so true because you know even, bring even back things, unions child just bring just the idea you get said again of like carpooling i think is amazing or like however yeah. however you can lessen the the um, energy work. that you have mm-hmm. ex- that you expended because when we think about when i think about how i was moving before the pandemic i i don't I can't even get back to that i can't operate like like i physically i like cannot I and that could be a blessing sick. in itself that so many yeah. people have that we now have that relativity to be like oh fuck that you want me to go back to the office but i ain't going back to the off to the that. lifestyle that i no. that you had me at before like yeah i'll go into no. the office twice a week yeah i'll go to the office like all right give me my four day week then yeah sure i'll go back to the office but you're not gonna yeah no. you can't the- like that's how i think it should go i think the conversation should be like set where your employees talk to the employer and like it had like the relationships, everything's different now. It all, all these peace treaties and all these agreements and everything has to be reconfigured. As we already know, I mean, all the way from the constitution, all the way down, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like everything right now, <laughs> everything right now needs to be dismantled, wiped away, cleaned out, irrigated, and like rebuilt. Um, with, you know, that's why we have board members and teams. People get together collectively collectively from different experiences and like shape what that future is. This is new world order. That's what the age of Aquarius is giving. I have no idea. Like, girl, I see it. And I'm just like, I love how optimistic you are about it. I'm like, no, it's going to crash and burn. We got to burn this shit down. We got to explode it. What's his thing is, again, and that's what I said. I said it's crazy. It's given Virgo because I understand the power of hard work and like mm. true Virgo characteristic is nature. It's that thinkless work. You get what I'm saying? I do the hard mm. things because like it needs to be done and they're thinkless. People don't understand how systems get set up and like whatever. They're autonomous and that's the peace. That's the Virgo point. You get what I'm saying? Virgo I worries and stresses that. about that's- all that so everybody could be at... It's seamless. You get what I'm saying? So like... I think a lot about it and I'm like, what does the world need right now? We're shifting and breaking, trying to hold on to things that don't no longer work. But there's some things about these things that do work based on how we are as a people. Collectively, we're so individual. Even if we have no other collectivity, like collective mindset within one another, aside from the fact that like I go to work every day just so the gas prices could be lower. Girl. I just if we thought simply. Not that like I like my job or any, I give it two days a week because of the fact that movement, you know, gets energy flowing. Stagnant things stack up like the inflation. That's what that is. It's inflammation. Like I'm over. Well, it. you know those those gas prices tricky. Those gas to hold on internet it gets tricky when it comes to the gas prices. No, right. We got a we and war stuff. and yeah. war and because yeah. of the war. Because of the yep, it's giving <laughs> war. Like it's giving it's war. It's giving new resources. World. Yep. <laughs> It's giving natural resources. It's giving like <laughs> landfills. It's, it's giving, giving global warming. It's 
Thanksgiving. <laughs> so <laughs> many things at once. And and that's another thing I also just want to say. I, I I think that so much can be done when we move collectively. Um, yes. But I also want to say like the the collective willpower also could be directed towards the motherfuckers that again are at war or again are mm -hmm. invading other folks's you know land Peace. are causing displacement are causing imbalance yes. in the environment mm -hmm. like i want us to move far move more away from like oh this idea that we're responsible for the change and moving towards like, oh, we have to make these people that have a lot of power and a lot of mm -hmm. money to make these changes as well, to like right. hear us. Because um, right. they'll have you think like, oh, yeah, all you better do is just, you know, carpool and the gas prices yep. will be okay, we'll go, nigga. Yep. What the fuck that's you another, and that's another thing that I have been like really just part of my personal journey where I've been like unpacking and just trying to process is like just working on I'm closing my eyes now, honestly, just to see it because like I've been trying to see what a world looks like and a society looks like of based on trust. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing a lot of work on unlearning things just so I can really feel like pour back into myself what the foundations and fundamentals of trust is. And like in in this is also something that I've been working on in therapy. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> like I've been like and I've done a couple of sessions in the, like complex trauma therapy before. So this is kind of like tying to that in which like, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to like, anyway, long story short, <laughs> girl, it's it, like, I start thinking about therapy <laughs> and the next thing you know, just start, like, gang signs start going up and just stuff like that. <laughs> girl. <laughs> I'm thankful for therapy because therapy allows that a place to go. I have to remember, like, oh, you're okay, you're safe now, like you're Aww, good. You um, thank you. That's one of my favorite places to be talking to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that, but um, I lost my train of thought. Help me out. You were just talking about the collective trust, like us as yes. as as building. Know. Yeah. building trust on agreements and mm. like just understanding like how mm. do we move forward mm. you know like building on like having a meeting of the minds creating these agreements and on each side of us sticking to them like literally like a peace treaty like deciding that this is what we are going to do and we are going to hold everybody accountable to do it and we are going to do it we're going to do it you know um eventually i feel like the narrative has like the ship has to be taken and trust has to be initiated, obviously, from this powerful side. You get what I'm saying? Like, we have to get, we have to show them our demands of how we're, like, what I love make that. The, uh, us trust them. You know, get what I'm I, saying? I, and then hold them accountable to that. We're not going to trust you until. Blank, I blank, love blank, that. Blank, blank, blank. I love that. And then move with that. Because I'm like, what is the next? It, it's, it's trust. Because like you said you want to be able to hear carpooling is going to help and that I will actually be able to do something carpooling. You get what I'm saying? But if the reality of it is, it's not, don't tell me that don't, uh, you know, and I don't know what to believe now. And that is also causing a lot of confusion and confliction. And what, where do we go next? Countries right now are like moving I, I at war. Like it's given like what, like, I mean, at, at the heart of it, you're right, is trust and is honesty and is accountability. And I think America would would be this amazing world power if she would actually be honest and accountable yeah. and be trustworthy. Because when you talk about it's peace atonement. treaties, yep. you talk about peace treaties and shit, America would be the first one to be like, psych. White flag. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'd be but the that's first what one. You did. Mm hmm. No, they'd be, they'd be the first ones to break it. Like, if you think what they yep, did to facts. the indigenous folks, like, yo, okay, yep. yeah. We, yeah, we're we going to take that right back. We won't no, invade right? and crouch in your land anymore. We Psych, won't take it. Like, mm -hmm. We won't steal it. You and the tribe you claim. We take it. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> yeah, America <laughs> gets is, on my goddamn nerves. She's, like, a, she's a little liar. She's she ruthless. Yeah. 
Yeah, she's not. So, but no, but to to just go back to the basics of like, hey, keep your promises. I think yeah. that, and and the and like you said, the people being the ones to like start creating these promises. Um, like we write the rules, like you said, like you know, like yeah. it's not everything. So yeah, I'm not saying that the answer Byron is like, yeah, we gonna get up and go back to work and this and a third. But these are the demands. If we are, you get what I'm right. saying. Like yeah. we're at a very fertile time where. <laughs> You know, we should be, we have the mic. You hear us? Like, everything, you see it. You get what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. like, we have, we also have, like, a lot of power, too. And um, our power is in, like you said, our numbers and how we unify and how we lift our voice. Lift every voice and Thank sing, right? Thank you for that. That, because that, that, that is a beautiful balance to my, burn it all <laughs> down and let the blood <sighs> I mean that too and when all else fails have the torches ready you get what I'm saying I like I'm it. not I'm not against it I was like I'd be like I try like you know, I'm I'm not trying to get the new game, just all get along uh, yeah. I literally would scream that while the world was burning down I just wanted to get along <laughs> like but oh well <laughs> oh well next lifetime <laughs> well Girl. I want to shout out some of the new patrons. Again, if you are a new listener or if you are a long-time listener, need to be reminded, I'm going to do it now. Around the Way Curls does have a Patreon where you can see us talk. You can see lovely faces of our guests and ourselves when we feel like getting zhuzhed up. And also some, you know, back-end content that is not on available on the podcast audio so we do have a patreon and we have some new patrons that i want to shout out shout out to jasmine shout out to alicia princess gloria kendra mm. b abasha alicia number two and Brittany. shout out to those around the way names as well lots of love right and i love it gratitude it black girl your, magic. you heard it <laughs> support <laughs> Um, if you cannot afford Patreon, we do understand you can help support us in other ways. All you need to do simply is rate, comment, and subscribe, um, to our YouTube, as well as to our podcast that is available on all streaming platforms. You can also just share. So if you're on our Instagram and you saw a clip or a picture or some, you know, just tell your friends, text somebody, listen to this. That is also greatly appreciated group chat um, worthy we are going to take a quick break and when we come back um i, lo- I love the duality of this episode because we started off really like ha, 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 key 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 burn it all down maybe yep. we'll all get along and um <laughs> we, <so> have, <laughs> we have <laughs> some really really important um soul work and conversation to share um led by you Aaron and I'm and excited the shit that well. you have shared with with folks publicly and we just want to extend that to our audience because I think it's really important so after these messages we'll be right back Doo-doo. all right oh! ah, all right <laughs> we did it all right we, we about to get into it. the meat and the potatoes now okay <laughs> potato Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> time there. Uh, we don't really take a break, but if you need to get like water or something, feel free. I'm straight. You're I'm good? Straight where I'm at. Yeah, right. I got my coffee and water with me. Coffee at 849? Girl, I'll be asleep. Be- Girl, I'll be asleep. <laughs> I'll be asleep. You still my sleep. sleep. That's a real coffee drinker. I- this is about cup six for today. I'm wow. literally going to be shower and get into the bed after after this conversation. I already know. I probably won't even need to shower. I probably lay right here in my little studio nook and go just like take a nap. I knew it was going to be late night for me as well, so I had like coffee around four, and I'm still okay. Like, but I can't imagine Mm-mm. six cups. I, but so a couple years ago, well, back in 2009, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor um, and high That's endocrinial pressures. Me. Mm -hmm. So I used caffeine to medicate for the pressures because like uh, caffeine helps uh, balance your cerebral fluid in your body. So like I would just drink copious amounts of coffee just to kind of like, you know, 
Right. Just to kind of take the edge off. I wasn't really, um, I was prescribed Percocets and I was away at college at the time. I went to Frostburg State University. So like I'm up in the mountains, high altitude taking, I'm like, I'm not taking these pain pillars, pain killers, excuse me. So I just switched over to caffeine and let's just say, haven't looked back. The rest is history. <laughs> the rest. I, I love a woman that drinks coffee. Like, and you, do you drink it black? I will if I need to. Do but you normally because I'm a cream of sugar. I'm a cream of sugar when I'm feeling like, like I don't know. Coffee's either a treat to me or coffee's a f u c k. You get what mm. I'm saying? Like coffee's mm-hmm. either like I need it to do what it's going to do, or mm-hmm. I want to make love to me. Like I want to savor it, like enjoy that. it, feel sweet. You know. <laughs> so it depends on my mood. It really depends on my mood I because if I can't get a pound in, I'm gonna go take one. You get what, what? I'm saying? <laughs> give myself one word word all right well Mm. here we go we back and so we're back and um i was just scrolling on social media and i stumbled upon aaron's post and this was uh maybe a month or so ago just about and um in this post it was a link to a youtube page And in this post, it was basically explaining your experience as a young girl and how, as a 13-year-old girl, you were groomed Mm -hmm. by a much older man. And you just sharing and working through the painful consequence that... Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, that kind of rippled and and ricocheted into your, into all areas of your life. Um, And basically sharing this so that other women can relieve themselves of the shame and the guilt and the feeling that they should have known better and understand that you are actually a victim of abuse So for those folks that, you know, may be experiencing this and may not actually have the emotional bandwidth, this is a big trigger warning um, because this is about abuse. You know, this is about rape. This is about being taken advantage of and Erin's healing through it and the story that she has to share through it. So I just want to make that very clear to everybody. And if you're not able to uh, handle that, now is the time for turn it off and (laughs) come back to it. But I I hope at some point that you do come back to it because I think that the, um, I think it's an important conversation and I think that you have a lot of insight and gems and, you know, you do a lot of heavy lifting for folks Mm -hmm. and bring a lot of language to stuff that feels really, really difficult and hard folks um girl when i say that i start not to cut you off i'm sorry no but when no, I, say, no. I realized that um it is hard i think that's one of the reasons why um the youtube video came about um it's interesting you mentioned earlier in the show about the place that you're currently at um you're currently in feels like everything is shifting and changing everything is pushing you no matter if you're moving or not you get what i'm saying and you're position right now is to figure out in what direction am I being pushed or do I want to push or move myself into and what I had realized with myself for a long time I had been in such enthralled in work and being a partner and being a mother that um I was not I was not well Mm. you know like I was not feeling like my best self Irregardless to on uh, what was going on around me, if really good things were going on around me, I just was not feeling, I wasn't feeling it. And I was trying to figure out um, why is it that as over 30, I'm 31, so like I'm 30 plus, and I realized, I don't know, like it was, it was this weird moment of realizing that people on the internet who don't know me can leave comments or make comments about me, good, better, and different, that I'm like, you really think that? You get what I'm saying? Like, it was a moment that was just like, hmm, um, wow. Or I never thought that. It was just like a very interesting perspective. Like, it was just something that kind of like would every comment would do so. You get what I'm saying? Someone, girl, you look good today. You think so? Mm-hmm. And it was just something in asking that question back. It made me wonder why 
I know I look good today. Obviously, I posted a photo. But what makes me wonder if they are telling me the truth? Hmm. What makes me wonder if they're lying to me? It just made me wonder why question, excuse me, made me question why my first response to that was a question. Now, hmm. peeling back layers, understanding where I'm at with uh, my my healing journey with um, childhood trauma, deflection <laughs> is a is a side effect of abuse whoa. you ain't gonna start <laughs> off with whoa nigga no so your inability to receive compliments where does oh. that come from you get what i'm saying I'm, I'm i'm asking myself like i'm not let's just say i'm not on this platform because i i, I do work that is like um that does not touch people and i will say one of the things that um was very interesting to me a couple years ago when you approached me <laughs> shanty you were like Aaron, I love your work. And I was like, how do you know me? You get what I'm saying? Like, like I, I can have, I've had, I've amassed thousands of followers. You get what I'm saying? But it was still this film of kind of like being out of touch with the reality, with me and this reality, if you're catching my drift. So something Mm -hmm. was just very like, now mind you, I'm a Pisces moon. So naturally I'm very intuitive, very dreamy. Everything could be very like romanticized or whatever, but I felt very disconnected. I'm like, everybody sees such great things. Why don't I feel at least equal to that? Where I can in good conscience say, you're right. And not feel cocky or indifferent or arrogant. You get what I'm saying? Like, you're right. Mm-hmm. Like, so I started to peel back the layers and do work. And um, one of the things that uh, I'm, I, I, I'm page break. I don't necessarily think that it, your platform, this space, without the consent of your listeners, would be to go into details about my story. Mm-hmm. I don't think that going into necessarily the details of my story would be helpful. But what I do think would be helpful is that we talk about identifying what grooming looks like as a consequence in your adulthood. Mm-hmm. Because I think a lot of us have experienced very similar experiences, but we we cannot identify them because we don't know what they look like, right? Mm-hmm. So case in point, tying into the, the compliments thing of the deflection being enabled or not being comfortable with receiving them. It took me back to a time where I remember where I was comfortable receiving compliments and who I was comfortable receiving compliments from Um, and thinking about the inappropriateness of that relationship, how those compliments made me feel Mm -hmm. thinking about when was the last time did I trust without question you know, um, and it put me around this time of being 13, right? So I'm thinking about 13 year old Aaron. What is she like? <laughs> what does she do? Like, you know, her Saturdays, like what did her mom, her routine? Like my mom, I was raised by a Virgo mother. So my mother had me pretty much on a routine Saturday mornings. You know, we get up, you wash up, you well, you have your breakfast, you wash up, you start cleaning. You get what I'm saying? And after that, my mom had me pretty much like, My mom had me at 17, so let me say that. And I know that she didn't know how to raise a baby, you know? So what she allowed was a lot of societies or the communities, like efforts or initiatives and programs to have their hand in doing so. Mm -hmm. So um, Mm -hmm. church, church was a big place. You get what I'm saying? That church was like, essentially it's supposed to be the safest place for a young woman um, to be dropped off, right? So be it like she's involved in sports, church um dance was an option you know i grew up in new york so the possibilities were endless but my mom was very big on you know you're going to be in places in which that i trust the adults that are around you um my mom was not a trusting person my mom was very strict we we kept to ourselves you know like we had a very um i don't know like i want i say new york lifestyle where it was like very my mom was extremely social we were social, um, but what happens in your house happens in your house. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you don't talk about the things that goes on outside of it. And uh, my mom and I, I'm the only girl. So my mom and I naturally, you know, women, we go through things with our mothers. And um, I had a really difficult relationship with my mother. I had- <laughs> I'm not even necessarily sure. Well, I do know where it stems from. It stems from the relationship with her mother. Like all of this stuff is genetic, you know, it's it's repetitive, right? (laughs) 
So my mom's relationship, obviously, with her mother and her lack of resources, having me young and, you know, just a lot of different things. I became a very, um, like, obedient child looking for... <sighs> to be seen, Love. To be, yeah, yeah. To be seen, to be held, looking for absolutely. a connection. Nurture. Yeah, You're looking a child. for... Yeah. Absolutely, right? Yeah. And it almost seems like um, a lot of us, a lot of young women, that is... That is who we are at our core. You know, we are extremely obedient. We want nothing but to be praised and looked at and seen for who we are. And I think um, there, and I think, in my, especially in my experience, I can speak for mine. There have been infractions upon me and my spirit long before I knew who my spirit was. Mm -hmm. So while as a young woman, you're searching and you're growing, you're realizing or you're feeling like pieces of you are actually missing, you know, like mm -hmm. there are voids that you are looking to fill. And one of the things that I... Uh, at a very young age, you're saying. Like, at a, right, from, right. From that you're looking. Your yeah. Right. Yeah. Just looking and longing, just yeah. like wishing and longing. Um, yeah. But longing not just for myself, but for her too. That's something that I was always like very cognitive and aware of, like girl, this is how I know trauma just does different things. And I'm pretty sure your listeners can relate just like wanting to overcompensate for your mother's pain. Right. So it, you hear her upset or crying that she can't pay for this, wishing that you were old enough to have a job so you can mm -hmm. pay for it, you know, mm -hmm. or, Hey mom, here's my allowance or here's some money I found on the street. Or even if for some of us, it, it would have become, we're perpetuating what we're watching. You get what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. oh, the girls date boys and the boys give the girls gifts and this, mm -hmm. that, and they're, how do I, as a, get, a girl get, lacking confidence, like, how do yeah. I, you know, how do I get there? How do I do that? And then what happens is, you know, while you're a young woman experiencing these things, you're going through them. There are people, there are adults, there are predators, right? <laughs> Who can see that? You know, we that, wear that it. That openness, on us. that, that. Ate, yep, that, that longing. longing. Yep, yeah, you know, because yep. in a child, that innocence is so free. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. I You're think so a lot open. of us. Yeah, you haven't learned to protect lot... yourself or to hide that. Right, the shame that... hasn't quite in yet. <laughs> right, shame the shame protected. hasn't set in yet. <laughs> it hasn't even been taught to you. To be yeah. honest with you, nothing yeah. has happened in which it's caused you shame. All you have is a longing and mm -hmm. a desire in which mm -hmm. to um to connect mm -hmm. and um. I, for a very long time, at least growing up, or felt like a very long time. At this point, you also have to remember when we're children, this is the epitome of our existence. You get what I'm saying? Everything that we're experiencing is the 100% highlight of my day or is the 100% nightmare of my day. You get what right. I'm saying? Or the, yeah. the week, like it's, it's mm -hmm. everything that I have to rest on. So, um, Part everything for the first why. time too like everything you've never you done this shit before you know i've never felt yeah. this before and that's yeah. something that i speak about um in relation to my story of realizing now on the hindsight realizing that the 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 relationship and i'm putting this in quotes that i had been in i had categorized this relationship as a significant relationship in my life for a very long time so this is giving some back history um my grooming experience i was 13 years old in he was 10 years my senior mm. and this relationship for me i believe that i was in for five years 23 girl for five years i believe that was in for five years yes. wow all through high school and a moving from uh from my mother when she found out <laughs> because that is also part of the story too at some point but <sighs> it was not properly addressed right or i'm handled. sorry what was not properly addressed when my mother found out, okay, I will okay. get to that part of the story. Okay. And like, you know, there is that, but my mother did ended up, my mother ended up finding out and she relocated us. I used, I grew up in New York. She relocated us to Maryland. The relationship continued while I was in Maryland mm -hmm. because grooming has that type of isolating effect. It has that type of control and it's, it's a long-term game. It's <sighs> the way he introduced and spoke to me at 13. He had all intentions of being able to use certain words here many years later and be able to ignite the same interactions, the same feelings. Mm -hmm. So what I realized, um, that the psychologically what grooming does to a young woman or what it has done to me, I can't say what it, like, I'm not a psychologist, right? I can't say what it does to everybody, but what it has done to me has kind of like extremely clouded my judgment on what relationships of mine were real and what relationships of mine 
are that were never like dangerous, toxic. Yeah, right. You give it a balance, inappropriate relationship. Inappropriate. Relationships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I highlight the word inappropriate because an inappropriate relationship will feel or could feel like the best thing for you. Mm-hmm. It could feel like this is made for me. I know there are some young women experiencing or listening to this story and can recall their first boyfriend still in the ones that they lost their virginity to, excuse me, the ones that they were raped by, you mm-hmm. know, frankly, and believe I gave my virginity to him. Mm-hmm. So excuse me while I correct myself here because I'm still unworking mm-hmm. that narrative mm-hmm. and understanding what has happened mm-hmm. to me because I still had believed that I had autonomy over my choices and decisions at 13. Are we letting our 13 year old daughters like, you know, might make their own decisions with their reproductive body. You get what I'm saying? Like, as far as like, is she ready to have sex? Do we know if she's, you you get what I'm saying? Do we feel Mm -hmm. like 13 year old girls can decide that for themselves and feel good about themselves at 30? Studies have shown probably not, right? Mm -hmm. That's what happens with the wisdom and that's what happens with the time spent. But by then we have all these women who are isolated from themselves don't know themselves, have minds completely polluted with ideas, thoughts, visions of themselves planted by someone who wanted to change or alter the mind of someone so free. You get what I'm saying? Like for a very long time, I had a really hard, um, it, I had a really hard time accepting whether or not if my thoughts were my own or were my thoughts given to me. That's something that like I pretty much weighed with psychologically with my own self, like feeling, do I like, the perfect example would be, do I like this type of music because I like it? Or do I like it because it was introduced to me by this way and through this person? Mm. Um, music does a thing like that, you know? So um, you're in a relationship. Now I'm grown. I'm in a consensual relationship now. And you hear music from a certain time that instantly regresses you or puts you back into certain experiences or certain places that inappropriately you didn't need to be as a child. Um, for context, I saw a TikTok a couple of weeks ago and it was like a this viral little thing of like, it was a green screen of like girls sitting in the backseat of a car, like holding like bottles of alcohol with her bags. And she's just kind of like, you know, 15 year old me in the backseat of a car, like guy I met on chat line to send it there, blah, blah, blah. We joke about the narrative, but so many of us have been like, taken advantage up. of yeah that was taken advantage up. of in in these ways of just looking for attention or looking for validation and the crazy part is i hear it in the narrative of today's predators to say she's just looking for attention and i'm giving it to her if it's not good attention if your that, intentions are not good why bother mm-hmm. you know there has to be a sense of self self-preservation you know like unfortunately there are things that I know now about my groomer because of, you know, we had a we had a five year relationship. There's a lot of that I know about his trauma and his childhood, right? That now I can step back and say, I see why you perpetuated these things. Mm-hmm. I know exactly why that happened. Yep. You were, you know? Mm-hmm. And I that's not your fault. However, you get what I'm saying, you have caused great damage. That is your fault. And that is and the truth is we have We have to acknowledge and accept our decisions, excuse me, and choices and the positions that we played and the hurt that we've caused on other people. So my grooming, Mm -hmm. me being groomed. Just just how you said, it is his responsibility and his accountability to go back to what void, what hurt, what connection he was wanting and in a perverse way, tried to meet his needs because yep. all of us are just trying to meet our needs. All yep. of us are trying to feel connection. All of us are trying yep. to be seen and held. So even in his sick way, mm-hmm. because he that's has to go back is. to, it's his perverse, because... it's a perverse way of like yep. getting your mm-hmm. needs met, but also you become perpetuating the toxic. You're not really, yes. you're not really scratching the itch. Yes. You're not, you're actually abusing, you're manipulating, you're causing more damage more damage you get what i'm saying it's very possible for you to undo damage or work on the damage that was caused to you but when you don't it's a slippery slope between when you are been damaged and then when you are causing it you are no longer 
it's hard to embrace you as the victim and hold you as the victim at that point when you are creating more victims. Because the truth is, growing up, I made exceptions, me as a 13-year-old girl thinking, I feel like this may be wrong. But I'm making exceptions because I am the only one, only as an adult to learn that I never was. Mm -hmm. So like, there's this, this, again, when I said like this work that I've been doing about realizing that, again, I could make space. I can say, yeah, that was my relationship, right? But I can't call this person, or I couldn't for a very long time call them a a pedophile. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, if you attracted to and sleeping with multiple children and when multiple is, children this person was doing it with there are multiple you give i remember my peers that you I mean, know what I'm saying? Like one is enough one is enough but that's what i'm saying but i remember recall my peers you get what i'm saying like when what brought a lot of this up and it wasn't necessarily the surviving r kelly thing because r kelly to me has oh like i've my abuser and R. Kelly look alike. They favor. We'll say that. And I was brought in under my abuser through the scope of music, being taught music. So there's just something about him that I've always been very I like, know. girl, girl, just like, I can't. You get what I'm saying? So I can't and I don't um, with the R. Kelly thing. But, you know, he had been thrown so much into the media that the conversation had been so loud that I started to feel like my body my work and everything, I started to feel like I can't pivot. You know how like in the pandemic, that was part of, that was the big word of the panty. Mm -hmm. Pivot, pivot, mm -hmm. pivot. All these businesses have to pivot in order to survive. I could not do so without, you know, I write, right? I write about everything that's going on in my day. I write about the things that I am thinking about feeling and how I ebb and flow. This has been on my mind all day the time in such a way in all my interactions embedded in such in such a negative toxic way like subtly though that like I realized I couldn't write anymore without this is the only thing I wanted to write about yeah it was just coming up it just was needing to come up you yeah. know like and again this is not something that it has it as far as like me being a very transparent person I realized out of all the stories I might have told this is the one that I haven't and this mm -hmm. is my biggest so mm -hmm. I had to pull into like what about me was still protecting mm. this person, this story, this experience? And of course, like me, I'm looking at trying to protect little me, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm protecting my imagery. I'm protecting mm -hmm. my, the thoughts, the autonomy I felt like I had over my body. I'm protecting little me to say, by not speaking, this is what I thought I was doing. I thought I was protecting myself to say, that didn't happen to you that way. You were special. That wasn't your story. It was a real relationship. There was real love and care. And, and that was real. That's the mind work. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, that is it. The realization yeah. that like, every time I said, yes, I couldn't, it doesn't matter. You get what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like that is hard to accept as the truth, not a truth, the truth, point mm -hmm. blank, period. The same way that I would think to serious you get what i'm saying like he cannot consent your to son me. for the for those my son the, the, sorry mm -hmm. yes the, my son the, is have a six-year-old little boy <laughs> he's beautiful little gemini crazy so <laughs> <laughs> i love him to death he's so funny he's so sweet um kanye before before um before the kanye um he's um yes yeah, so serious like I, he cannot consent without Without age, without wisdom, you get what I'm saying? He cannot do that for himself right now. And I know that ultimately I can ask him, hey, babe, what do you want for dinner? But the final decision is my own. You know, mm -hmm. he cannot get up and go do it himself. So because I was still under the rule and thumb of my parents, who I realized that, you know, over time that the relationship I was having with this person, they were pulling me away. They were, I already felt isolated, but they were not counseling me or not in my life, you know, with my best interest at heart my your best interest is your family do you mm -hmm. get what i'm saying like um your family is not perfect granted you get what i'm saying my family was not perfect by any means but to this day the people that love me the most you know would be my mother you get mm -hmm. what i'm saying for a very long time that relationship that i have created dynamics with my mom or created a relationship in a world that i have with her currently that affects me now and that's still my mother and she's still mm -hmm. here i have hard times talking to my own mother now um 
honestly, because even as an adult now, I think like I still hold her accountable to some of the things that have happened to me. I hold her accountable to the lack of um, supervision that I had. I, I, I resonate with that so much. I didn't have a similar, I wasn't groomed. Okay. But I, I was, I feel neglected in a way that opened me up to explore things. Things that you probably would I should never not have, that my mother and my father to. should have noticed and should have been very vigilant about and walked me through aside from like, don't do that or the slap on the wrist no. when they did find or, out. Cause my parents, no cause I started having sex early too. And my parents, my mom and dad found out and it was just about you're a prize. You have to yeah. have more worth. And, but yeah, more all the shame. And, but then it just, it just created a shame. Because it I wasn't, still feel this hole. I still no, feel no. invalid. I still it feel It wasn't this, about, yeah. it, it, they didn't tap into it. I, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of fast, right? Especially with the black right. community. I don't know if white folks talk about this. <laughs> but there, girl, for me, I there's am. an archetype of fast girls in the hood that, again, is somebody that we look down upon and is held solely responsible for her actions and is not seen as a precious child that should be considered or cared for. And so it's this, I, in my, in, in, in my recollection of fast girls, quote unquote, fast girls Mm -hmm. in my growing up were the girls that were, not shy about their sexuality who often were f- more developed in their bodies and like more in tune in their bodies in a specific kind of way again it, they're just far more sensual beings they would not shy away from and would often be in complete or direct pursuit of exchange with men and men that were older and you know, um, were, were didn't shy around fucking like they were fucking. I, they made it known that they were fucking. They would seek it yeah. out. They would be the ones that would be in the men's face. Yeah, and we're in the bathrooms. We're in the bathrooms. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. And I think we always would label those. Oh, she fast. Oh, she's a hoe. Or she's ran through. Mm-hmm. And these were girls that were. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. They probably had a baby or 17. Yep. Like my mother se- had when you got 17. higher, like the, mm-hmm. the consequences of that early or how shit. many children, yep. Or mm-hmm. how many kids they had, had or, yep. you know, um, and depends on, especially her early teens that she had multiple children by then that validated that she was a fast girl. She was you a fast, that, yeah, she, it, the, but that was never. It. It was mm-hmm. never a concern. It was always the the responsibility, a labeling, a, labeling, a shaming, or like a uh, um, ex- exalting, if, if, yeah. if you will, kind of like a banishment. Excluding. Yeah. Yes. It was like, you know, you she a hoe, she doing her whole thing. Like she got men, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. the, and the stories that would come up would be terrible. Like in my adult mind now, girls that had trains ran on them, girls that were in Recorded. having sex with older men in the car, drug dealers, whatever yeah. was going on. Yeah. But it was Just never to hear like, the story. Yeah. Never never to never to care for them. And I think that there is something which you which you were saying in the in the how they were almost open wounds in a way that their pain was far yeah. more palpable than maybe somebody that was um more shy or more reserved or like even if they had gone through traumatic things they were a little bit less out there about it yeah right like i think that's the thing about and that's the reality how trauma kind of like works i'm gonna i'm gonna I'm a take it a step back for a second and kind of like just share with you where i even came up where the title and the talk kind of like came up and how it was like birth um shikari richardson right mm-hmm. She's been in the media and the news a lot, right? And one of the things, doesn't matter whatever the negative press has been, she always been like, but I'm fast though. But I'm fast though. 
but I'm fast though, you know, and it put in perspective to me, hmm, some women actually are literally fast. Mm -hmm. And that is point blank period. Meaning like I'm quick to see, I'm quick to dismantle. I'm quick to disrupt. I'm quick to like, you know, or I'm fast. Literally I can run quickly. You know, we're not all this Fast is not monolithic. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Like this idea. Some people have had other experiences in life that have progressed them, aged them to a certain Mature place. You get them, what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. And I'm watching these things. You know, we're just thinking about the power that she had behind her. Her mom just passed. You get what I'm saying? Like she had that on her. She has the weed in the system because she was coping with the death of the mother, but she was able to watch what she was able to accomplish, right? We were not thinking that at all, watching her perform. You get what I'm saying? Some people from the stands rooting for her. Some people from the stands hating her for how fast she is. She, I showed up and I did what I'm here to do. You get what I'm saying? The rest of this is your banter, is your talk. Like it's for you. My, it, in her, the fable of the tortoise and the hare, you get what I'm saying? Like we all have positions that in part that we play. Shikari plays this part. And I'm looking at this idea that there are women who play a part in society that highlight the trauma in this society you get what i'm saying like where they're they are the whistleblowers you get what i'm saying like the people around them are the whistleblowers if we know that this woman is aching or this child has been aching child, child. this child emphasized we know that this child is aching and we see the people gravitating to this aching child are broken busted older drug dealing like how is it her how is she being fast Mm -hmm. Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, she's being led astray. She's mm -hmm. being taken advantage you know, of. Right. And I'm looking at and We already know the narrative. We talk about it all the time with gender roles and stuff like that for a very long time. <sighs> Power dynamics are interesting because like in a cishet relationship and stuff like that, men take the lead, you know, and that's what as young women, as we see in our help and our households or homes or parental figures, you see the men or the man taking the initiative, taking the lead in the women's case who don't have, you know, fathers or who are missing uh, a pivotal piece of their developmental like growth. They're looking for that energy. They're looking to replace it. And someone who does not have a child's best interest at heart doesn't have the boundary to say, okay, you seem like you are, you're a really talkative child. You get what I'm saying? That's the truth. You get what I'm saying? Because the truth is, an older person, you might he might have been in a position where he just, nobody talks to me. You're a very talkative child. It's mm -hmm. a match made in heaven at that point, right? You get what I'm saying? You didn't have to do much. He had to do no effort mm -hmm. to be a listener. And she has to do no effort to talk. You mm -hmm. have them here, like you said, two people with this deficit mm -hmm. doing this thing. And it's all inappropriate. Nothing, we know, nothing good materializes an infertile so soil. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So like the fact that the foundation of the relationship is inappropriate, everything that it will touch as a result of it will be inappropriate as well. And I started to look at the relationship with myself um, in a very similar way. Like I said, like certain conversations or certain compliments that I would hear my adult self, I couldn't understand why I was like, that's not true. Well, what about me doesn't believe that? And I would think about the time, right? Perfect example. This is going to sound so silly. Which, and I'm going to talk about trigger warning. Like I'm going to reference the body of an adolescent child. You know, I ain't had no butt. I didn't get a butt until I gave birth to Siri, until I got pregnant. You go to say like, I, maybe bringing the booties. Let's go. Hello, my Woman woman, that's an, yep. I ain't get one until I got so. You get what I'm saying? So like for a very long time, I was very insecure about my backside. Like black woman shit, you know, like if you don't have a badunka dunk, like mm -hmm. are you black? You get mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So like for me, I remember as a narrative or a conversation piece, he would talk about my butt. The fact that I have one often. Mm -hmm. And to the point that like, now this shame, you get what I'm saying? I'm hyper aware of it at 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. um, thinking of shame of like, no, I don't have one. Guess what? Now I got one now, right? So when someone comments on it, I'm like, no, I don't. And they're like, are you crazy? You get mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I'm like, 
No. Well, then, okay, they're like, okay, you just, like, I'm, it teeter totters this line of dishonest almost mm. with being that you so think del- somebody's being you don't know if you can trust the person or vice versa they're looking at something directly and i'm telling them that it's not that you get what mm. i'm saying what mm. and i'm saying that like people who are clear-minded they see it clearly i'm the one that's confused they're mm. not confused and this is something that's just something I'm, I'm looking at simply as a comment about my body your hair is your hat is red could be a and you're like really you know your head is red. You get what I'm saying? Like you, it, this is not up for debate. It's not a question. I had to figure out why did I question everything about myself? I can analyze, I can see everything else, but I would ask myself and run it past my thoughts twice before I confirmed it or denied it. And I realized for me, a lot of that was because of a lot of thoughts were projected into me early about myself. I'm hyper aware of myself because of I had a 10 year age gap of a person telling me of all the things about myself. You get what I'm saying? So I'm very mindful of how I come across. I'm very mindful of how I can rub people the wrong way. If anything, it's been highlighted that I rub people the wrong way in the, in these ways since I've been 13. You get what I'm saying? Like it's made me hyper aware of things that what happens if all this, like I said, I'm acknowledging that this relationship wasn't a relationship, right? an appropriate one it's a lot of the things that were told about me or said like i'm trying to throw away things that don't work or don't fit narratives that never were real but used to control me and then also like trying to move forward and be like clear you get what i'm saying like it's almost there have been times i've been very frustrated with the fact of being like This is not how it was supposed to go. Children are not supposed to be taken advantage of. What happened or when did you realize that, oh, this is not this. I have to, I have to get out of this or rather most importantly, when did you realize that this is actually abuse? And and that may be a completely two different timeline. I think that they are because I'm still, um, and this is me being extremely candid. I could still call them. You know, like if I wanted to. So it took me, uh, it took me maybe about a good four, maybe five, six years ago when I realized like I'm angry whenever this person hits me up. You know, like mm. I, I felt angry and I felt like anger and Your disgust. Body hold, keep score. Yes. Woo. Girl, I therapy. That was the first book that I got told to read. You get what I'm saying? Like, um, so for sure, like I felt hot and heated and but i would still answer there was something in me that still felt indebted Loyal to, to answer that. you get what i'm saying here comes the protection here comes mm-hmm. a lot of the things because to me i consented to this relationship mm-hmm. now look at me i'm an adult i'm a mother i don't want nothing from you he's still living his mama house you go to say he's 40 something years old now like he's still living in his mama house still ain't got it together I don't know much else, but I just know that karma is a thing. You get what I'm saying? I see what happens when you take advantage of someone's innocence. Yeah. Yep. I see what happens point blank Mm -hmm. period. Now you can do the work and that will land you. That will land you in Jana. That will land you in heaven. You get what I'm Mm -hmm. saying? Like, excuse me, that will put you where you need to go at your resting place. But until you get there, you will be... (laughs) You won't be at rest. Do you get what I'm saying? So there's a lot of, um, we've had, he and I have had many conversations over the years of me, like while I've been unlearning, while I was figuring it out. Um, so I want to say the first time when I got out of it, I I got out of it at 18, 19. That's when I kind of like went ghost. Um, because I was, I had met someone new Mm -hmm. my age and I had shared with them. I had disclosed with them, like, this is what the experience that I have been experiencing. And they were like, oh no, get this weird ass, old ass nigga away from me. You know, like their response to it was, <laughs> their response was to real. it kind of real was life, real world. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and up until that point, like I so said, with the isolation. So let me scale back the way it was in New York. I, I didn't understand it at the time, but I see it now. I was labeled a fast girl, you know, mm-hmm. like I had the body. Mm-hmm. I remember getting in trouble in fifth grade because like a little boy told the teacher that I was doing like this in my shirt in art class. And I was like, 
you mean when you stuck a piece of paper in my back of my mm. shirt and I like, mm. you get what I'm saying? Like, it was just something to make me do it to get me in trouble. And here I'm like, it's, that was the first time that I was like, I got in trouble for my body, like yeah. in a place where I was like, I didn't do anything. That's fifth grade. You get what I'm saying? Like I, 13 is that eighth. You get what I'm saying? Like, so I was in a very vulnerable place with little boys or the little older boys in the hood like they would make comments they people knew though my mom didn't play so none of these people close to me they would make comments or it's different stuff like that but ultimately i was off limits to uh, the men because my mom is young my mom knew these men so my mom was very like i see y'all but the one place that she left me unattended my mom didn't attention attend with me no Mm -hmm. She doing yeah. what she needs to do. You get what I'm saying? I need that. That's what she's looking. How she, New York stuff, girl. Just drop your baby off and go. <laughs> you know, single mother like, stuff, girl. And single mother stuff. Like you yeah. need the community, and ain't nothing wrong with that. But then the community nothing. gotta have to have your back for like protect women, protect mothers, children, be there for them. protect children. children. Like, facts and period you, so, you know what's so crazy about this whole situation years later i found out that you know different directors of the church program and stuff had meetings with this person you get what i'm yeah. saying like or meetings or things would come up people but knew people and that's that's that, uh, this has I'm been sorry, part of, again i'm sorry this is, this, i'm so sorry not only I'm did so they know sorry. i was shamed and judged and this is why my mom like i said like i had to put in perspective for me i didn't understand mm-hmm. as a kid why we picked up and moved i came back from summer camp my mom the u-haul was packed when my mom drove down the hill so, like you get what i'm saying like we got out the car she was like all right get in the u-haul i had just like i had just crossed over socially by doing um like I was a drum major ever, like a community marching band at the time. And like, I had just accepted that we were doing a Puerto Rican day parade the next day. And like, I was so ready and pumped. And this was the first time I'm doing like a major parade in, in New York city. And my mom was like, "Where well, you're not going, we're moving. And she my mom, you nothing. no, what she told me was I read your diary. Oh. I had been gone for weeks. <laughs> oh. She had a lot of time to, you get what I'm saying? Well, I had left. And she found out what she found out and she picked us up and she moved us. Mind you, because my mom at the time, were her, were, we had a lot of fights after that. Give a lot of resistance, you know, uh, but um, there was no therapy. There was a lot of blame on me. You get what I'm saying? There was a lot of blame. But look what you did to the family. Look what you had to, we had to do, you know, to save you. And mm-hmm. I held on to that for a very long time because there was a lot of, with my family stuff, a lot of things shifted and changed. We lost a lot of community when we moved. There was nobody, you know, we didn't have the support. So my family experienced homelessness. There have been a lot of things that I've carried since then that I've had to kind of like, you know, just like release myself of because I assumed that this relationship that I'm thinking was the highlight of my life. Like the, it set the president. For my relationships. You get what I'm saying? So like we it, continuously go back. It, it, to- it there's this interesting thing, this hard thing, and I have an eleven year old mm-hmm. girl, right? And there's especially with mother daughter um relationships, there's this very thin line between holding and celebrating your daughter's blooming into a woman Mm -hmm. discovering her sensual power right because like when you're 13 14 that's when you know you start getting attention and you start realizing this power that you have and mothers either resent you for it (laughs) shame you for it facts neglect it completely and act like it's not there doesn't exist right you'll figure it out somehow like or some way or they mm-hmm. like and i don't know many mothers but there probably are some mothers that possibly you know like embrace em- embrace yeah. i hope that a mother can em- embrace it my hope is I'm, I'm just talking about the negative part i didn't possibly. mean embrace like positive but like join you I like mean, now right like, like we sisters like, now right. we run in these streets right. like let's let's we do this here. thing we, we out outside. here you know be outside no facts and <laughs> and then you know when when you do find out because similar to, to me when my parents found out that i was sexually active they were shocked 
And then it's like, you're shocked. They were shocked. I was shamed. And then it was closed. I, I did what I need to do. We had the talk and then it's, it's closed not to consider what, what to continue to explore and uncover and talk to and handhold and go back to East space. Yes. To East go back. space. Yep. And, and just yep. be there with them. Like that's a time where you get even more close to your baby girl. If you find when out I that think she's about been it. having sex yep. for, for two, you've been having, what a thing. But, girl. but we have so <laughs> much, your mom and my parents had so much shit that they weren't able to, to articulate and mm-hmm. name and work through that they didn't, she didn't even have the capacity. And all trust you me, know, know is like, Girl, I got my ass whooped. You get what I'm saying? Like, trust me, I know. Like, because her thought was, and for a very long time again, and it's so crazy, she said, you know better. You know better. And don't. And why don't you care? Why, why don't you have higher regard for yourself? Don't for you yourself. know you're worthy? Yeah. Don't you, like, didn't I show you? And didn't the truth is, it, no. No. And the reality of it is no one can show you. And that is... That is the conversation you give us saying our parents here are here to aid us. They are here to journey with us and maybe even have the conversation with us. It's like, baby, that has to pull from yourself. And this is why I'm talking to you, trying to give me the tools for you to quantify what that looks like for you. Because like you have to, the truth is you're going to have to stand strong on it. The reality of it is once my mother and I got closer, we've had these conversations. I think what she, what she expressed to me was the world got to me before she could. You get what I'm saying? My mom and I were so close in age that, mind you, she she was right. I did know better. I knew that the relationship on paper wasn't good. I knew that if the police found out that this would be wrong, I knew these things, but there was a need that I was looking to fill. And that I distinctly remember because there was not at home, you know, like- and that's- I think that's the crux. I think that that is the meat and potatoes of it, though. The you know, just it's like disposition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like this. And I'll I'll just speak as a single mom, right? Like as a single mom, you have so much responsibility, and the <laughs> needs of a child. We we also just like limit the needs to a child as like, oh, you in a good school, you're getting mm-hmm. good grades, you're you have good manners, you you, you eat dress well. well. And you eaten well, and mm-hmm. you you able to clean up. If you've if you've hit all of those marks, like I'm doing, doing a good a job. Yep, I'm doing it. But thing. like you have no sense of how your baby is unfolding in their inner world, in their mind. Yeah, in their minds, in their hearts. Are you like? Do you how check are you in? Really yeah, connecting you? with your your kid. Intimate, and that's intimacy. Intimate. Because that is exactly what my groomer used. Because like I wasn't Ugh. like a I wasn't a regular child. Mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't want to just sit and play with toys and stuff no, like that. No, I had emotional intelligence. Yes, yeah. emotional yeah. intelligence. I had mm-hmm. questions about why what is love, you know? Mm-hmm. And why why are people homeless? You know, I had mm-hmm. questions that like my parents couldn't spend the time. I distinctly remember sometimes my asking my mother questions and she'd be like, Can you stop? She could no. she didn't have the capacity for that. She didn't have the capacity for you. And as much as now as an adult, I understand that it's like, damn. It, and this is like not to put my mama T in business out there, but I knew before me, you had a termination before me. What was the point? Why mm-hmm. pick and choose? You get what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like to the point in which that you brought this child here only to then give up and then say, I don't have the capacity. Only and then the withdraw. child is just supposed to accept it, you know? Because, and then because- the child demands intimacy from them, you know? You can't have a kid, and, that, and that's too much. They touch on because, all of your your hard po- areas. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? They yeah, want- No facts. Yep, they, they make you go into yourself. You get what I'm yeah. saying? Like, in serious, my son, he will ask me questions that, like, will knock the wind out my chest. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? Sorry, my computer <laughs> heard me say that, but... um. He will ask me a question. <laughs> yep. He will ask me a question and knock the wind out my chest. And I'm just sitting here like, thankfully, my overthinking ass, I thought about this already. You get what I'm saying? Like, I may not have come to an answer, but I've literally, like, it shows me 
there's something, there's a practice that I do often and it may not be good. I don't know, but I'm going to just throw it out there and feel free. Other people may do it or feel free to take it up if you don't. But when I'm talking to my son, I look at him in the eyes and I like, I imagine I look at him as he is, but then I imagine myself looking at me from his age. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Like I put myself in a six-year-old body and I think about, and I immediately try to feel like what, something as simple as you remember caramel apples. Mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite scents when I was six. You get what I'm saying? Like I can recall the vibe, the mood, what I'm feeling it because then I put myself back into his shoes. And when he's looking at me and when I'm redirecting him, when I'm oh, sharing it cry. Wow. girl yeah. it, it, it's mm -hmm. I have to because without it I'm trying to figure out even when you ask me this question what are you asking you know like what do you want to know because I don't want to just answer this is my crazy self I don't want to just answer what you're asking me you know I kind of want to prompt you to ask more questions because maybe there's more to what you were asking and what you were trying to get at. Now, some things you're not going to be interested in. You're not going to ask another thing. Cool. But I don't want you to feel like I'm disinterested in what you organically you just brought to me. That just, I think you just blows seeing, my mind. You're seeing him. You're holding yeah. him. And it ain't even about the questions yeah. and the answers. It's about yeah. the attention. It's about the yeah. patience. It's about in, the intimacy. openness. It's about yeah. the connection. It's about the energy that you're allowing him to feel what it's like to have this back and forth of forth. like, Oh, somebody yeah. sees me. Somebody cares about me. They're what they're there for me. I feel yeah. safe with them. Yeah. I can go to them and feel safe. I can go to them and feel I, safe. Cause that's my needs parents... are met in a way that you don't have to go anywhere Either else. Pull it in or fish for it and pull it out or of you fish for because because that's the it, thing and accept it from anybody as well yeah because that's the thing if i feel like i gotta or if a child has the, the relationship or with you where they're where the you know how some children are just like emotionally like you know really open and fluid mm -hmm. you know they just go up and hug you they mm -hmm. ask you how your day was mm -hmm. when that child put is putting in all that emotional labor i was that child i'm mm -hmm. putting in all that emotional labor in on my parents my mom, at one point, I remember seeing, she used to have like notifications pop up on her phone to remind her to hug us, like individually. My mom had three kids. You could, it would say, hug, hug Aaron, hug Kenny. Like, you know, it would say like for her consciously. Now she would do it when she felt moved, but what happens if she's moving around too much and she realizes she had to put her arms around us in the moment. She had figured out, you get what I'm saying? Like, I have to consciously be aware when I was younger, my mama or daddy wasn't around to hug me. I want, there was sometimes I just wanted a random hug, you know? So she, so when I saw that, I remember feeling some type of, I was like, you have to put a reminder in your phone to hug me. She said, that's for the extra times in which that I'm like, I feel like I'm too busy or that I might forget, which is reality. You know, like as a mother, as a single mom, <laughs> we have so many things on our plate that just because maybe, maybe because they're not crawling into our laps right now at this point, because they've learned to be self-sufficient, you know, like, that's what evolution is. Eventually we adapt. So whatever it is that you've been looking for, for me from since you entered this world earth side, you know, like I'm on, I'm still on the quest of figuring that out. Um, I may have felt like I, I gave my son enough cuddles and stuff as a new mom. Right. But our relationship now could reflect that maybe I didn't, maybe his relationship with other women can reflect that I did. not yeah. I still yeah. have time to build though. Yeah. He's still my child, yeah. Yeah. you know? Um, no, I'm you, you good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good. Okay. We 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 could go on and on about this. I see, girl. Um, but I don't want to. I I want to kind of two things that I want to make clear. Um, you know, again, you, you had to recognize what had happened, how you yes. were taken advantage of, and then you had to recognize the consequence of all of these things, which is, you know, these feelings of, um, inadequacy, uh, lack and, of clarity. Yeah, if you could start naming self, them and then mm -hmm. lack of self-confidence, girl, I got a, a bit because it, it really represents the unashamed <laughs> woman, uh, brand or narrative that are kind of like, kind of like created. And that was organic too, because that was also me. It is impossible to shame a woman who is unashamed came from me recognizing that I had been taken advantage of. That's 
that sentiment in my first book um is from that that epiphany you get what i'm saying like to the point that's when i realized that i was in the point in my in my evolution and journey that without telling the story there is no other context you get what i'm saying like you don't it makes a lot more sense my brashness you get what i'm saying like like just the way that i'm here makes sense based on how I was taken advantage of. But now I'm taking control of the narrative without having the story, without being able to pinpoint it. Um, you're kind of like, just like making a mess everywhere. You know, mm-hmm. like you don't, you, you're not really um, in tune with yourself or in tune how other people can receive you because not everybody has the same experiences as you. Mm-hmm. So what I was experiencing was like extreme imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. You know, who am I? Um, That was a major question that I could start, have performative answers for. And when I mean by performative, you know, like questions, somebody say, talk about yourself. And you're like, you say the things, I'm kind, I'm nice, I'm compassionate. This, that, you get what I'm saying? Like I have rehearsed something in which that, you know, you size that up to your peers and people are like, yeah, you're that, you're that, you're that. You kind of like the, these things are validated. But then there was points where I would hear things that were new. And like I said, I would be uncomfortable with the fact that like, I couldn't even confidently say yes or no. I I love that conviction. There's some people are so convicted um, about themselves mm-hmm. that like I was enamored with being with some people not no like or some people no that person's not capable of that you know mm-hmm. if somebody i realized a lot of people with me were ambiguous they didn't know what i was capable of and that kind of made me feel some type of way i was like well i'm only this person i'm only this and whatever but and then i realized mm, well the reason why i'm not like this all the time is because i've learned people are like that you get what i'm saying i started to realize where the clauses were inserted and how i made a lot of like provisions for living based off of my fear of what people could or would be capable of or did. Mm -hmm. Um, So I spent a lot of time um, not necessarily thinking the worst of people, but not necessarily thinking that they were capable of being good. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of worrying about the people that I'm inviting into my life, like just second guessing Mm -hmm. myself. And I had to realize like, where did the second guessing come from? Like I felt I go from feeling extremely sure to unsure where, how, you know, nothing has, nothing has drastically changed, or at least Mm. that's what I felt like the pandemic. Yes. But that was part of it. Isolation, you know, like it put me back. Um, I regressed. It put me back into a space of realizing that like, I don't know what is anymore Mm -hmm. and this had nothing to do with the internet per se for me because i none of that again i would see comments on the internet and be like what you know so i had a a disconnect with the people or with people in that like space of that regard in reference to how they viewed me because i would get into close interpersonal relationships with people and felt like they i felt like i am showing them myself but being read or misread and Mm -hmm. i'm like how is that possible? You get what I'm saying? In my mind, I'm thinking I'm this. I'm thinking I'm that. Why isn't that translating? Instead of being like, I'm okay with like, oh, I don't have any friends, which is not necessarily true. You get what I'm saying? Instead of being okay with that, it's unpacking that. Why are you okay and confident saying as a grown ass woman, you ain't got no friends? Mm -hmm. Like, Like that is a trophy to carry around like Mm. you're happy with that narrative as if it's a thing like oh i just do my own thing i see that narrative a lot like you know women i don't hang in groups i don't do this and there blah 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 your sisters are some of the best most intimate non-sexual love that you will ever have in your life you know Mm -hmm. and once you realize that as a wealth you you realize that as a currency you want to keep it around you want to be that you want to be known as a good friend you want to be known as these things that people now granted i have people in my life that regardless of what i've experienced they see me you know but it made me wonder the people that don't know me can they see me you know so good better and different so it just made me kind of ask myself the question um as far as in terms of like validation can i validate myself and in what ways can i validate myself and unlearning uh or dismantling shame Mm -hmm. has been a big part of the next chapter in my life because fear is exceptionally debilitating, you know, like to the point that, um, 
literally it'll physically make you sick you know mm -hmm. so without having the clarity of kind of like just hearing where certain narratives or the certain ways i thought about myself or my capabilities came from now mind you um again i thought this relationship was real right so i'm not saying all of it was like a whole bunch of like grooming doesn't grooming is not necessarily abusive in the terms of like you ain't shh you, you know, and a whole bunch of negative. No, uh -huh. this was a lot of positive affirmation and right. talk, but, but it was inflation. Yeah. Correct. It was inflated in a way that could be very dangerous and damaging. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So like, and because I'm hyper aware of that, I'm underperforming. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I'm holding myself to, am I as great? You get what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Am I really? Or is this pseudo? Is this projected? Is this grandiose because this person had an agenda and they wanted me word, to be word, that word. that train of that agenda yeah. you get what i'm saying like it's yeah. a very interesting thing and yeah. i started to to scale back and um i don't know if people notice but i i've even become very exceptionally more modest in how i post you know just mm -hmm. trying to be really intentional about the imagery yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about the imagery and um what I'm sharing, because for a very long time, I have been unlearning mm -hmm. a lot of things. And now with a more conscientious effort, I'm I, I see 30, you know, I see things a lot differently now. And I can see them a lot clearer being able to pinpoint the last time I had my free thoughts, you know, like my free. And I'm not talking about like um, when I was told, like, you know, that some women are just sexually liberated. You know, like some women are just to explain why I should feel comfortable with mine. Because for me, I wasn't, I was very prudish, you know, I was very to myself. If anything, my experience exalted my promiscuity, exalted my showingness, you know, like exalted, it gave the people, if, if anything, what they wanted in trying to shame me. It was almost like, we were going to do reverse psychology because this is how we really want her to be. So mm. I had to unlearn things. I'm like, like naturally it was so crazy. I could talk about sex, but like, I'm also very like private about right. things. You get what I'm saying? Mm. So being mm. as though, like I realized that based off certain images or certain, whatever people thinking I'm open and I'm like, Oh, I see where are you getting I these see. ideas from? You uh -huh. get what I'm and I had to really put myself in, like I said, perspective position. And I had to not just my truth, that truth, the truth, you know? And I had to look at it like, okay, if I've never met me before, never had a conversation with me, what does this look like? I'm, I'm, just, I'm saying, what does this look like? My, what is my agenda? What side of the fence am I on? You know? And ultimately for me, I've always been on the fence of a woman it is impossible to shame a woman who is unashamed, period. Doesn't matter in what? Political choices, body choices, you know, spiritual choices. If one day I decided to wake up and I wanted to completely convert my life over to Islam, I am unashamed. You get what I'm saying? Yes. It's to me is in the liberation of realizing you have that full autonomy and control over yourself as that adult woman. And it, that's why it emphasizes womanhood because that's when I realized no one's going to change this narrative for you. There's not going to be a prince to come in and save you. You have to do it yourself. You get what I'm saying? So like once I put that hat on and acknowledged that everything else became like full speed ahead, you know? So that's pretty much where I'm at in my journey, where I realized <laughs> that self-doubt doesn't fit in anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I can't make money and be like are people gonna like that it's right. not gonna work anymore right. for me like right, it's right, not right. cute anymore you know right. like it's when you're a young girl and you're trying to figure these things out sure maybe you get what i'm saying like the damsel in distress thing and that uh, up into that as an adult woman you're gonna loop and continue to be taken advantage of and be heartbroken right. and be ostracized and be worn yeah. through and the next yeah. thing you know these are all your personal choices and decisions this yeah. was your autonomy you know yeah. and i didn't I was like, nah, this won't be my narrative. But you have to go you know? back to that source of, of, of what yeah. was causing that disconnect in the first place. And I had to and think about the last time I remembered, like before the pressures, you get what I'm saying? But what's the last, before I was thinking about sex, what I look mm -hmm. like, my body. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this all goes stems back before 
that moment before it was fourth of july weekend in 2003 i mean 2004 excuse me and so, then unraveling the corruption of of so much innocence and the taking advantage of the openness yeah. and the ache yes, yes. and it, i think it's really important that we acknowledge and hold space and compassion for that ache because i think it's yeah. just a part of the human experience and it's yeah. not like you know um women or men or whoever who didn't or did fall victim to being taken advantage of you know that that, that it's any fault of us right or ours that we experience one being very open yeah and two having that ache or having that longing for connection nothing's wrong with that and it um, doesn't go away. That's something. And it don't like, go away. You know, that's it's the truth. You get better at parenting, yeah. partnering, whatever. It's that's just that's part of the existential angst and how how we care for ourselves and love up on ourselves is is how we manage it because it's just man. It's about managing it. It ain't going nowhere like you. It's said. not going nowhere. I, I think of Antoinette. I wish she was here on um, this episode because I think. She's such an open being. She's such a, a an, an honest about her age. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think she has felt um, frustrated. I'm not going to speak for her, but I see yeah. her feeling frustrated and often taken advantage of or even overlooked because people that see that are, are like overwhelmed by it or, no, you know. And I think she, I don't know her when she was a little girl, but I can imagine her being that open young open, girl. Yeah, I can see that it. Like there's some connection, people who generous don't lose with the it energy. And who yeah. don't lose it. And that is something that, that's also the beautiful, that's the beautiful part in the aching. Because mm -hmm. the idea is you don't want to lose it. And that's no, why it hurts so it's much. It's a natural, <laughs> it's a human, con it's a need for it's, connection. It's who I am, you know? Yeah. So that's part yeah. of the and why I like, and to get rid of it, like you, you, we know women like this, where you're like, we can't connect with her. Like she's, she's, she's lost herself along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's no fault of her own, mm -hmm. but there was a choice in which that she had to choose survival or herself. And she just chose to live in this show, you know, mm -hmm. and that is not, we know we see it all the time, like 60, 70, 80 year old women dying alone we see it in that because it was in the inability to forgive yourself for the position mm -hmm. you played mm -hmm. in the disadvantages that you know that were against you you had no play in that you didn't play mm -hmm. in it and it was the reality no one no one even knows it to be able to tell you because you took it with you you're just holding on to it and that's that's something that I realize as children, we don't do. Children are very innocent and open and fragrant with their um, their stories. They they speak to one another. They tell. I was at home and mommy put her wig on a. You know, like they talk to one They're another. Open, they open. Yeah. And when we decide that no, I no longer want to do that, we do ourselves such a disservice that we live unhappy with for the rest of however, whenever we make that decision until. But once we've made that decision, we also don't grow past that point, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, so when if you made that decision at 11 years old, you're still 11 on how you answer conflict, you know? Mm -hmm. You're still 11 how you show up to work, to doing work you don't want to do. You're, mm -hmm. You have never... To getting your needs met, to asking for your needs to be met, to, right. yeah, to, to be find able to pleasure, to, to find connection. Yeah. Most importantly, in how you find pleasure, how you find connection. Yes. You know, because in that um, connection, there is all the things. There is the pleasure, there's the knowledge, there's the wisdom, yeah. there's the growth. The growth. So, like, I guess that answers the question. You are still, it, it feels like you have not shied away and you're moving away from shaming and, um, finding a uh, fault or blame for the little 13 year old Aaron who was open enough. Absolutely. Because there was, to be taken another, advantage and continue to do that. There was a know. major context of that, that, like I said, I'm still working on acknowledging now this is difficult because like I said, there were a lot of adults to me. I, I didn't know that so many adults were aware 
you know, sure. um, as a child in that my situation, I really thought that I had it under wraps. Let's say that. So that is something that um, to kind of like be on the opposite end on the other side of it now or to be working on getting to the other side of it and, you know, sharing or disclosing certain things with people from that time. They're kind of like, well, yeah, we knew, but, you know, like that is. It's you, difficult. you deserve to be protected and I'm sorry that you weren't. You deserve to be protected. You deserve somebody to have to hold you accountable, to tell you different, to consistently pursue and help you to tangle yourself. Because you were tangled to prioritize your freedom and your liberation as a 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old girl caught up. Just right. trying to have your needs met by somebody yeah. that wasn't safe. Yeah, like, and you, the whole crazy, this girl, we, like I said, we could talk about this forever, especially, like you said, um, and I think a lot of us, especially who've experienced these things, have a natural knack of, there's two extremes. We either are overtly aggressive with, to go after what it is that we want, or we accept the things that come to us, you know? Mm-hmm. And I find myself between the balance, or at least in my life, I have been between the extremes, not the balance, <laughs> the extremes where I'm overtly aggressive. No, I want this. I'm, I'm hell bent on it. I'm, I'm all fire behind it. And this is not a good idea or decision. I didn't think this through, you know, or the opposite. I'm hyper-focused on myself. I got my tunnel vision on and now I'm only entertaining this because now it's landed in my lap. You know, a boundary is a boundary. That's something about being taken advantage of that for me that I had realized that I had troubles with. Um, understanding boundaries um which th- that's not good for relationships child <laughs> like you get what i'm saying like <laughs> no, that's not, not good at all um mm-hmm. and i think boundary i think we throw that word boundaries around so lucidly that i think from what i've learned and what i've been learning boundaries are bound <laughs> boundless <laughs> you get what i'm saying for a lack of better term in which like my boundaries are mine yours are yours and they're subtle we have subtle boundaries we have hard boundaries you know we have boundaries in which that once you get close to you don't even know that that person has hit a boundary until like you're you reacted you get what i'm saying based off Mm -hmm. the things and the experiences in which that you've had in your personal life and my and i have my own the reality of it is our own experiences are also also show us how we respect in a establish our boundaries with other people i can't say to you hey i don't like it when you call my phone back to back to back but then i call your phone back to back to back right. <laughs> you get what i'm saying like it's a and the only reason why i don't like it is because i don't want to feel the need to answer my phone you get what i'm saying like it's not even a real bound it's something that i've just been learning and unworking and unlearning mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know uh, reconfiguring for myself as far as like are my ideas are my pet peeves are my wants desires these are they on my own original thought mm-hmm. that was a simple question that i asked myself and if they were you know okay cool stored under a core belief or something of mine that validates and kind of like affirms who i am as a person you know acknowledging who i am um anything else that doesn't fit or just seems like outdated or this and like i wasn't tied to it so that goes back to my hair you get what i'm saying like in which Mm -hmm. this process i had been in where i was like okay i was here for this period of time i acknowledge that i see that it was either great glorious indifferent whatever here's my review here's what's next (laughs) You you get what i'm saying here's what's next um and that is okay you know so that narrative of me being taken advantage of at 13 you know that happened you know sigh you know like accept breathe in sigh release but i don't have to perpetuate the behaviors and live in the isolation and to continue like you know self-doubt and the second guessing in my Mm -hmm. 30s that's double Mm -hmm. that's over the lifespan in which the infraction happened Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i've been living with it longer as a result than i actually got to experience it i would i thought that oh this is the person i was going to be married to like with all my beliefs, I thought all of that was worth it because I thought we were going to be, I'm not even divorced from the person. And I had all opportunity, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I could call them if I wanted to. So I, I, I knew that that's not what I wanted. 
I didn't know what I needed to do. You get what I'm saying? In order mm-hmm. to kind of free myself from the mental prison that I had been in. I had gotten away from the relationship. I felt in control. But you've you know? been perpetuating that in your spirit. Yeah. And with the relationships I had been in, you know, like yep. after yep. that, like and that's how, that's how it be. That's how girl. it be. Girl. Shout out to you. Shout out to the child work you're probably doing. Shout out to you looking like a baby again with your baby face <laughs> cutting your hair off. Shout I out to it. you healing your, you, your your younger self and your relationship with your son. Um, shout out to all of us that are doing the work and, and just, you know, what is the uh, child? I can't remember anything, <laughs> but um, I believe Angela Davis. I think Angela Davis said, I'm not sure, but like liberation comes by pulling pulling it up from the roots. What the hell is that saying? Let me get it together. Something like that. Liberation means pulling it up from, from the roots. I need somebody to help me. No. Yeah. I can't find it, but, um, I should have Angela Davis. What does she say? Yeah. Angie. Ah, yes. Radical. Radical. Yep. The the concept yep. of radical simply means pulling something up from the root. And I think this radical self-love or this radical whatever, transformation, whatever, you're doing radical shit by grasping um, from the root and, yeah. and growing it. anew, right? Like you're growing anew. Um, reinvention. I think reinventing that- yourself. I while also I, deeply caring for yourself and that and that the parts that hurt right because you can't just like throw it away it's still like right you can't you stuff to tend it's gonna follow you and that's the yeah. truth and i think that was the reality for me that in the moment i didn't think that i was affected by something mm. that for me it was probably aside from my birth and my actual existence this has been equal to half of my story. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. There is no Aaron without this part of the story. Mm-hmm. So when we ask, whenever I've done an interview or asked the question, like, what, did, where did the woke quote, quote come from? I had never told that story. So to mm-hmm. get that context, it didn't fit in. That's mm-hmm. the way I'm feeling. No, mm-hmm. this is new. I'm, I'm on my new trajectory. This mm-hmm. is my new life. You know, mm-hmm. everybody that was a part of my life when I was in New York, before I moved the adults that knew these things, look at me now. You know, Mm -hmm. that was what I had been focused on when the reality of it is, regardless of if it was on their mind or not, that it was, that was on my heart. Look at me now, you know, and that, who am I? You get what I'm saying? And that's something so subtle that I think that you won't even, even, I'm pretty sure even some people hearing this conversation, you have to be at a certain level of honesty within yourself to acknowledge, you know, if certain accolades or successes or ways that you view yourself are disingenuous or not you Mm know is it Um, really coming from a place of 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 your authenticity or is it coming from a a place of trying to recover and hide from trauma you know or trying to outlive a thing or you know doing like you know or working on um ancestral work or genetic hereditary trauma and this that and third like i had to right (laughs) real work um spiritual work so like for me i had to kind of like take a break and just really look at it like the reality of the situation is you think that you were unaffected good for you you are you are of man you get what i'm saying you're a human so like Mm -hmm. of course you think you have the answers you know Mm -hmm. so in my submission (laughs) in my submission to my spirit like where does my spirit go when um i have questions you know and what what space am I filling up in myself by being like questioning myself at this rate, the work that I put in the, you know, the accolades I've amassed, the stuff that I built with my own hands. I don't need anybody else to confirm it. I have writings and I technically have journals filled with stuff that no one's ever seen that it doesn't disqualify me as being a writer because I don't post it, you know, like, and I know that what else do I know, you know, with that same conviction. And I think that that is very important when it comes to, you know, identifying ourselves and our, pushing ourselves forward. And if we are our biggest support, the growth. Yep. right? Continuing like it's work. can't be done for us, you know? So it has to be self-motivated and. Well, I'm, I'm sure, I, I'm sure we're going to have more to talk about. I, I, sure. I definitely want to have you on again. I have two kids. Yes. 
kicking and cackling in the back, and it's about ten oh nine, so I have to do yep. some um, like smack dance. Yeah, come yep. on now, let's get it together. Let's go to sleep. Um, they're taking advantage of me in this moment. But, I um, have to do the same. If you would like to watch the video, um, I think everybody should, especially if this is something that you think um, you experienced and you just are just trying to now develop the language around it. Please check out Aaron's YouTube channel. It's Good Karma. Um, if you like to learn and see the growth of Aaron from when she was very, very little itty bitty thing to where she is now you can check her out on her instagram at erin mel ism how do yes. you spell that e-r-y-n-a-m-e-l-i-s-m like Badu if you want to Baduism, Erin yep. yep. If you want to support her, and I hope that you do, she's a mother, she's an artist, she's yeah. a writer, she's a wonderful creative being, and she does deserve our support. Check her out at her shop. It's Erin Amel Shop with two E's. I swear you've seen her work before, so you're going to connect a lot of dots and things are going to come full circle. Like, oh my God, I saw that. I saw that shirt. <laughs> I saw that book. That's why she looked familiar to me. Um, That's cool, though. Like, you know, support like, the homie, an amazing businesswoman and mine, so much, and man. self published author. So I thank you. I appreciate you. you. So many things have even um, become more clear and apparent to me and are calling me to be even more accountable and responsible in my work. So you're doing the work there, gal. Well, I think, you know, I think that's exactly what work should feel like. The work should be on ourselves. Like you can't tell nobody about themselves without you doing it. And I think the, the biggest review teller out here is you doing the work and people seeing it work for you and then they applying it for themselves. So Amen. I don't need no accolades. I don't need no, like, you know, I don't need no, nobody to be like, Aaron did this. No, but it's self work, you know, and I'm just thankful for this space to kind of like flow with it you know so okay, i really thank appreciate you for you sharing this and your transparency <laughs> and uh honesty and oh, yeah we're seeing a growth i think especially because people think that they like you said they think they know you and it's yeah. like you don't know you don't literally I let's know. go down the rabbit hole I don't you even know, know my stuff. I'm figuring it out my damn. You know, I'm switching her <laughs> up or whatever. She was cute. She cuter now. Like, you know, like, you know I See, just think the reality of it is like you are allowed to reinvent yourself, you know? And that you better be. Has, you should that, be. You, you are allowed to. And then like shit. without the reminder, and if we listen to everybody else, everybody else is so busy fighting over who gets to who doesn't. You get what I'm saying? No, I ain't got mm -hmm. time for that. So while y'all busy figuring it out, I'm gonna do, and then you realize, oh wait, before you look up. That's who you are. Always been solid, you know? So like, it is what it is. So we're here now. Is there anything Let's... else you want to share with the people? Is anything coming up or are you just... I, you, you I'm pretty much, it. I'm open. My, I know that this work, this conversation could, like I said, we already know, could be very loaded and very heavy. Um, I have been doing said work a little, for a, for a while now, you know, conscientiously doing the work so if anybody wants to have like open conversation or is looking for space i'm not asking for my dms to be open to dump on me but mm -hmm. i would say like you know like if you want to shoot me a message or send me an email my all my con my connection is through social media so if you have anything you would like to say or offer support or leave a comment under the youtube like you know it gives me space to talk more about my experience um, I have a part three coming out. I've, I'm doing it in parts as the journey unfolds itself, you know? Wow. So I will, girl, I'm, it's, it's not a, it doesn't work like that. It's not just a story, you know? And that's it. There's work that has to be done. The calling a spade a spade was just the start, you know? Um, and there's just a lot a work that can be done in getting women to recognize not just when it happens in themselves, but how we can stop it from happening to our children. And, and that's another, and that's and a whole the, other episode. I girl, we, we need to get to that because that's very important. And that's I see important. a lot. You get what I'm saying? I see a lot with parents creating like the social media for their children. Like I see a lot. So I'm so. trying my hardest to back walk right now and lay the groundworks because 40, 50 year old Aaron needs this groundwork laid in order when I'm ready. Like, like, 
I, I may not be accessible to sit and have all these conversations with you, but here's the roadmap. You okay. get what I'm saying? <laughs> Take like, advantage of all you can. Like Maya Angelou you might have some, on the phone you with y'all. To talk to her agent or her manager or some shit, or she might be in a cave in Costa Rica someplace just Actually, away from all of y'all. <laughs> All right, we well, well this is at. this is a <laughs> this is a very long episode, but I hope yeah. that I think it was worth it. And um, again, rate, comment, share, subscribe, and we will see y'all next week. We out. Boom, boom, boom. All right, Queen, thank you. You're so welcome. I'm gonna leave this up. Yeah, let me That's stop. 99%. Hold up, leave it up. I just stopped.